Well, hello there, and welcome to a brand new episode of Pick 6 Movies. We're doing something a little different on this episode, but before we get into that, let's catch you up on what it is we do when we're doing something a little normal. See, this is a podcast on the internet, and that means two guys, me, Bo Ransdell, and my oldest and best pal, Chad Cooper, are talking about a bunch of nonsense. The Nonsense in Question is a show about movies, six of them to be precise, and we pick those six movies each season around a theme. The theme for this season, season 25, is Holiday Road, where we are talking about a half dozen road trip movies. We do a little introduction about the movie and then come back together, all Wonder Twin style, to discuss the movie in question. And this is where the unusual part comes in. We normally talk about a movie that is questionable at best and downright bad in most cases. This time, though, we are talking about a genuinely great movie. Thelma and Louise, a story of friendship with a great script, great performances, great editing. So what the hell are we going to talk about? Well, since you're here already, how about you join us for the rest of this trip through a very good film? Chad, get in here and tell us how this really good movie got made already, will ya? It's time to record the intro! Hello, Beth S., the intern. Not to be confused with Beth T., the intern. We've never had two interns with the same name, let alone two interns both named Beth. Hey, Beth S., don't tell Beth T., but I like you, Beth S., the best. And it's not just because you're listed first in the alphabetical order in our staff roster here at Pick 6 Movies. Beth S., let me ask you a question. What do you know about Paducah, Kentucky? Well, I'm about to take that absolutely nothing and turn it into absolutely something. Beth S., Paducah, Kentucky is located at the confluence of the Tennessee and Ohio rivers on the western part of the great state of Kentucky. It's about halfway between Nashville, Tennessee to the southeast and St. Louis, Missouri to its northwest. And in 1991, the National Quilt Museum opened, and it's unofficially known as Quilt City. Yeah, it has a population of around 27,000 citizens, and it's the location of the Dippin' Dot Ice Cream Empire Headquarters. Notable people from Paducah, Kentucky include weatherman Sam Champion, who you might know from ABC's Good Morning America, PGA golfer Kenny Perry, professional WWE wrestler Ricochet. Rumor has it that Rumor Willis, daughter of Bruce Willis and Demi Moore, was born there. Have you heard of her? Of course you haven't. Let me ask you this, Beth S. What do you know about Paducah, Kentucky's beloved hometown writer Callie Corey? Well, let's say we turn that nothing at all into a whole lot of amazing at all. Callie Corey was raised in Paducah, Kentucky, after her family relocated from San Antonio, Texas, when she was very young. Callie grew up in the South of the 1960s, filled with segregated movie theaters and schools. As she grew into a young woman, she was acutely aware of the hypocrisy and prejudices that surrounded her. Her family was better off than others, with her mother, Virginia, active in their church and local arts community, and her father, Eli, was the head of the regional medical associates at a local hospital. Callie was close to both of her parents, citing her father's drive as an overachiever as a real driving influence for her later in life. When she was 16, her father complained of a headache and went to the hospital. Shortly after, he suffered a cerebral aneurysm and he died within 24 hours, and everything changed for Callie and her mother. Callie continued through high school. She was active in theater productions that brought her a sense of escapism, but later in life, Callie reflected on this time and said the 10 years after her father's death was just a real fog. She began to read books and magazines and opened her eyes to the life of possibilities beyond her small hometown, especially for a young woman. Callie went to Purdue University for no real reason at all. It was a large university. It was a place where she said she could just intentionally get lost and maybe find her way to somewhere. She majored in landscape architecture because why not? She ultimately changed her major to theater, looking back on her high school years and the refuge that theater productions provided her during a time of such deep sorrow for both her and her mother. Callie dropped out of college just shy of getting her degree, describing her time in higher education as a wasted experience. She moved to Nashville, Tennessee at the age of 21. She picked up some work in theaters and wound up waiting tables at local music venues, including the Exit Inn. 
and she surrounded herself with all types of creative forces, including musicians from genres ranging from rock to bluegrass, country, and jazz. One night, a young country singer named Pam Tillis was performing on a stage and asked if she could have a Coca-Cola. Callie brought Pam the beverage and handed it over, and Pam looked at Callie and said, you're not just a waitress. And Callie responded, you're not just a singer. And this was the start of a lifelong friendship between Callie and Pam. They were two very different people, but together they complemented one another and they were a force to be reckoned with. Pam was messy and scattered. Callie was methodical. Pam was naive. Callie was jaded. Pam was innocent. Callie had a smart ass mouth. Two different people that were also very much the same. After four years in Nashville, Callie decided it was time to head west, so she moved to Los Angeles and got an apartment in West Hollywood in 1982. Callie studied at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute, and she waited tables at the Improv Comedy Club. In the mid-1980s, stand-up comedy was exploding. Overnight, comedians could go from standing behind a microphone in a smoke-filled darkroom at 2 a.m. pitching jokes to sitting next to Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show with multiple offers for a sitcom pilot deal with a show named after and starring them. Callie hung out with some of the funniest people of the time, Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno, Paul Reiser, Robin Williams, and Callie fit in perfectly slinging comedic insults and jabs with the best of them. She was a smart, sassy Southern woman who let people know she would not be taken advantage of. As much as she enjoyed her time with the comedians at the improv, Callie never aspired to be a comedian. This may have been influenced by the perception that women didn't have the required aggression needed to be a stand-up comic at the time, or at least meet the expectations of what audiences wanted from a stand-up comic. At the time, Roseanne Barr was really the only comedian who was able to deliver the comedic feminine hostility to break out as a superstar, the likes of which had not really occurred since Joan Rivers arrived on the scene years earlier. Callie continued pursuing acting, but after a while, she realized it wasn't in her future. It was 1985, Callie's career hit a wall. She was smarter than most of the men she worked with. Hell, she was funnier than most of the men she worked with, and this hurt. Plus, Callie continued to feel the impact of her father's death while trying to find direction in her life throughout her 20s. Callie left her job at the Improv, moved to a new home near the beach in Santa Monica, and took a job as a receptionist who helped to manage the logistics for music videos. Again, this was the 1980s. MTV was huge, and every band needed a music video to go with their hopefully hit song. Callie hired wannabe starlets and strippers to wear spandex and dance around behind Alice Cooper or Winger, or a list of bands you've probably never heard of. She swept sound stages. She did whatever was asked of her. Well, almost everything. Callie had a front row seat to the misogyny and the subjugation of women in front of and behind the camera. She worked her way up from the reception desk into video production, all the time suppressing her outrage at what she saw all around her, often looking the other way just to get her job done. Women in the film and video industry were not in a place to stand up to the male dominant power structure. Unless you were Jane Fonda or Barbara Streisand, you couldn't take the establishment head on. In 1987, Callie was working as a line producer, doing everything from delivering film to the labs, ordering lighting, scouting location, and arranging casting, all unsatisfying work, but it was a great place for her to learn. Up and coming film directors full of visual flair and no restraint got behind the camera to make music videos in the minor leagues of major motion pictures. Pictures. Michael Bay, David Fincher, and countless others cranked out music videos in hopes of getting the chance to make a feature film. Callie was underpaid compared to her male counterparts, doing work that was often degrading to women, casting for Motley Crue and White Snake videos, providing women in bikinis to prance around behind guys with big hair and minimal talent. But bills had to be paid, and Callie kept her head down to keep the lights on. Callie believed that you get what you settle for, and she was tired of settling for what she was getting. In the spring of 1988, Callie Curry was 30 years old. She was driving home from work, and out of nowhere, inspiration struck. Two women go on a crime spree. That one sentence. She felt the characters and immediately saw the entire movie. Callie had never written a movie script before, but she had one to write now. She knew where the women started and where they would end. They would go from being invisible to being too big for the world to contain. They would stop cooperating and they would just be themselves. Over the next six months, Callie wrote the draft 
of her screenplay. Two lower class women in Arkansas leave to go on a fishing weekend. Things get out of control, turning an innocent weekend of fun into a mix of desperation, exhilaration, and liberation. Callie's screenplay also found inspiration in some violent encounters that happened to her. One involving her and comedian Larry David being robbed by some young men outside of the improv. And on a separate occasion, Callie and her lifelong friend Pam Tillis were jumped and a thief tried to steal Callie's purse. Callie put up a struggle until Pam told her to just let the purse go. Callie listened to her friend and the assailants ran away safely. Callie later said to Pam, if I'd had a gun, I've killed them. Two friends, Pam and Callie. One, a lovable, compliant, sweet, free spirit. The other, an orderly, wounded person with a quick wit and a smart mouth. Thelma and Louise. Callie's goal was to make a low-budget indie film to hopefully get some broader distribution. This was a growing trend in the 1980s. Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing and Steven Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape showed that independent movies could reach a broader audience and be commercially and critically successful films, leading to bigger and better things for aspiring writers and directors. Callie wanted the movie to star Holly Hunter and Frances McDormand. She worked her connections and the project was pitched to different production companies, but everybody said no. And by everybody, it was mostly men who read the script, and they said no because they felt that the two lead characters were unsympathetic and they were women. Eventually, the script landed in the hands of a friend named Mimi Polk, who ran Ridley Scott's production company. Ridley Scott had a few movies to his credit. Alien, starring Sigourney Weaver, that was a big hit. Blade Runner, starring Harrison Ford, not a big hit. Legend, with Tom Cruise, definitely not a hit. And Black Rain, starring Michael Douglas, uh, a so-so hit. He was not the Ridley Scott we know today, because he had yet to direct Thelma Louise, or Gladiator, or The Martian. Polk read the script and completely identified with the character situations, just every about it. She gave the script to Ridley Scott in hopes of his production company helping to get the movie get made. Ridley Scott loved the script, so much so that he bought the rights to the movie for $500,000, but he had no interest in directing the movie. Ridley Scott initially considered his brother Tony Scott, who was fresh off his success directing Top Gun and Beverly Hills Cop 2. The latter movie features a scene where the hero of that film, Axel Foley, is saved when his partner Lieutenant Taggart shoots the movie's villain as played by Brigitte Nielsen by shooting this woman off screen, then stepping into frame and saying, women, while Axel Foley laughs with that inhaled brain that he often did. Maybe Tony Scott was not the right choice to make Thelma and Louise. Ridley Scott took the script to his brother to see if he would be interested in directing it, and Tony Scott declined because, quote, listen, dude, it's two bitches in a car. Mm, Tony Scott, definitely not the best choice to make Thelma and Louise. Tony Scott's next movie at the time was Days of Thunder, a movie about alpha males racing around in circles. You can go find that one on this podcast. We did it, and it's a exactly what you would expect. Let's move on. Other A-list directors were considered, including Richard Donner, who was fresh off of directing Lethal Weapons 1 and 2. Kevin Reynolds was considered. He would later go on to find great success with Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and then his career would crash and burn with Waterworld. Bob Rafelson, who directed Five Easy Pieces, was considered, but everybody turned it down. They couldn't see in Callie's script what Ridley Scott saw. This movie was epic, set against a landscape that itself was a character in the movie. And the more Ridley Scott spent with Callie discussing their vision of the film, the more he realized that he was the right choice to direct the movie. After all, he was the one who decided Ripley and Alien should be cast as a woman and not a man. His production company was run by women. He recognized this movie was filled with male characters that were childish, dangerous, misguided, and vulgar. He knew that the movie required a delicate touch to blend the weightiness of the film along with the humor that Callie wove into her characters and their dialogue. But this was show business. Callie wrote an incredible screenplay and turning it into a successful movie by not alienating half of your potential audience, men. A movie about two women on a road trip crime spree needed humor. This script was full of men behaving badly across the spectrum of bad male behavior. Scott felt that the movie would be a mirror held up for many men to see themselves, and humor would make this self-reflection easier to see. During the early stages of pre-production, the two leads were cast, and the movie was going to star Jodie Foster and Michelle Pfeiffer. But as you know, this is not how things ultimately turned out. Ridley Scott went to his friend Alan Ladd Jr., who was the head of Pate Entertainment at the time. 
dad, Jr., was a studio executive at the time Blade Runner was made, and he had a history of taking chances on innovative movies, including Body Heat, The Right Stuff, and Chariots of Fire. Lad Jr. also had a history of producing high-quality movies about women, such as Julia, The Turning Point, and An Unmarried Woman. Paith Entertainment was financed by an unknown Italian investor named Giancarlo Peretti. I'm not going to get into the history of this production company or the state of its finances at the time in this introduction. Just know that their money troubles were only surpassed by their legal woes. It's a small miracle that Thelma and Louise was ever made, released, or had any dollars to help promote it. But Alan Ladd Jr. loved the project, and he was able to secure financial backing to get the movie off the ground. As pre-production drug on, Michelle Pfeiffer was offered the lead role in Silence of the Lambs, but opted instead to star in the movie Love Field, which you've probably never heard of. Jodie Foster also dropped out of Thelma and Louise to famously go fill the vacancy left by Michelle Pfeiffer, starring as Clarice in the movie Silence of the Lambs. In any given year, there were maybe eight to 10 solid roles for leading actresses. And I'm being generous here. In 1991, the year Thelma and Louise was released, the top grossing movie was Terminator 2, a movie that had a strong female character, Sarah Connor, as played by Linda Hamilton. Now, the fifth highest grossing film that year was Silence of the Lambs, again, also with a strong female lead. But everything else in the top 10, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Hook, JFK, The Naked Gun Two and a Half, The Addams Family, Cape Fear, Hot Shot, these are all movies that were absent strong female lead characters. The point I'm trying to make is that for actresses in Hollywood, the options are shockingly limited and decisions to stay with a project or leave for another role are really based on what options are available at the time. And at the time, it was unsure if Thelma and Louise would ever be made. With Michelle Pfeiffer and Jodie Foster out, there was a need to recast the leads. Enter Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn. This was very close to happening. Streep loved the script, but did not love the ending of the movie. She really wanted at least Thelma or Louise to meet a different outcome than the one in the original story. Now, if you haven't seen Thelma and Louise or forgot how it ends, Thelma and Louise both die. This wasn't just a concern by Streep. The film producers were concerned audiences wouldn't react positively to such a tragic ending. However, Callie was immovable on this point. From the moment inspiration struck, she knew how this movie would start and more importantly, how it would end. Ridley Scott agreed, but he was open to shooting an alternate ending where one or both of the women survive based on early screenings and how audiences react. Meryl Streep ultimately dropped out due to a conflict with another movie and Goldie Hawn was deemed just not right for the part. During this entire pre-production time, one actress showed determination to be cast in the movie Thelma and Louise. That was Gina Davis. Gina Davis had her agent call Ridley Scott's production company every week for the better part of a year, inquiring as to how she could get cast in this movie. Gina Davis had just won a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her role in The Accidental Tourist. She was a known actress and was on the rise, appearing alongside Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie, renowned asshole Chevy Chase in the movie Fletch, Jeff Goldblum in The Fly, and Michael Keaton in Beetlejuice. Ridley Scott met with Gina Davis, and she came prepared with an hour's worth of arguments as to why she should play Louise the headstrong, more grounded of the two female leads. Ridley Scott listened to her argument and then said, so you wouldn't play Thelma? Gina Davis stopped, thought about it and realized, yeah, I should be playing Thelma. And she got the part, contingent on who would be playing Louise. Susan Sarandon at the time was 44 years old. She was not only an established actress, but also a political activist going after President Bush for portraying people of color. Now, this is Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, it would be a few years later where Kanye West went after W for not caring about black people next to a stunned Mike Myers on live TV. Ridley Scott met with Susan Sarandon and felt that her poise, authority, and sensibility to play Louise was a perfect fit for Gina Davis as Thelma. Now let's turn to the casting of the men in this movie, and there are a lot of them. Ridley Scott felt that the lead detective, Hal Slocum, who follows the crime spree of the movie's heroines, was key to the film's success. Slocum was a man who felt that the two women were victims of bad luck and bad decisions. He was sympathetic 
and he really just wants to do what's right by the law and right by these two people. Harvey Keitel was known for playing hard, rough characters, like his appearance in Taxi Driver, and Keitel also appeared in Ridley Scott's first film, The Duelist. It was almost against type for Keitel to play a good guy, but after some convincing by Ridley Scott, Keitel agreed to take the part and he fell into the role of a Southern lawman sympathetic to the film's female leads. Thelma's husband, Daryl, arguably the movie's comedic relief, was described in Callie's screenplay as a man for whom polyester was made. Gina Davis recommended her ex-boyfriend, Christopher McDonald, who would later go on to gain fame as Shooter McGavin in the Adam Sandler comedy, Happy Gilmore. McDonald and Davis were dating at the time. Davis was making The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. The making of that film broke up the previous romance, and it led to Gina Davis marrying Jeff Goldblum, her second of four marriages. Whoa, good for her. The role of Jimmy, Louise's boyfriend, was filled by Michael Madsen, who was friends with Harvey Keitel at the time, and he would later go on to play the guy who tortured that cop and cut off his ear with a straight razor as Steeler Wheels Stuck in the Middle with You played in Quentin Tarantino's film Reservoir Dogs. <gasps> Ridley Scott originally wanted Madsen to play the role of Harlan, the man who assaults Thelma, but Madsen didn't want to risk being known as a rapist for the rest of his career. Ridley Scott couldn't see Madsen and Sarandon as a couple and asked for the two to go to lunch. And they did. And it went very well. Madsen got the part and he delivered a performance of a man who was complicated, troubled, and at the same time, Principled. Lastly, there was the casting of JD, the hitchhiker cowboy hustler. Ridley Scott auditioned a lot of good looking young actors. His number one choice was Billy Baldwin, fresh off his performance in Flatliners. However, Baldwin ended up taking a role in the Ron Howard ensemble firefighter movie Backdraft, a film that starred Kurt Russell, Robert De Niro, Donald Sutherland, Jennifer Jason Lee, Scott Glenn, Rebecca De Mornay, JT Walsh, and of course, Clint Howard. That's a hell of a cast, and it's a pretty good movie if you've never seen it. Other actors were considered and offered the role, but conflicts prevented the perfect match from appearing. Throughout this whole audition process, a young, handsome, let's be honest, gorgeous sculpted movie star to be was auditioning for the role of JD. I'm speaking, of course, about Brad Pitt. As the movie got closer to starting production, four finalists were brought in to read for the part alongside Gina Davis. Davis was so smitten with Pitt's acting, good looks, and just movie movie star quality, she flubbed her lines. As Ridley Scott and the casting directors wrestled over which one of the four finalists to pick, it was Gina Davis who said, the blonde one, duh, and Brad Pitt got the part. Brad Pitt gave this small role a big personality. He was good looking white trash. He was polite, charming, seductive, and funny. Pitt's performance added to Ridley Scott's vision of the movie balancing heavy drama with comedic undertones. Reportedly, one of the other finalists who auditioned but was not selected was an actor with work on sitcoms and a few small budget films at the time. An actor by the name of George Clooney, maybe you heard of him? who went on to luckily find success elsewhere in Hollywood. Ridley Scott, who is British, also had a senior production team that was from the UK, including production designer Nora Spencer and Thom Noble. And their awe of the American West helped the movie to reintroduce the majestic landscapes of the film to American filmgoers. Composer Hans Zimmer provided the music to deliver a score that reflected the character's tone and majesty of Ridley Scott's vision. Now, there's so much more that I could discuss regarding this movie's production and I highly recommend you pick up a copy of Becky Aikman's book, Off the Cliff, which chronicles how Thelma and Louise got made. It is fantastic. It is a wonderful read for anyone interested in the messy, misogynistic manner in which movies get made. Please go buy it, read it. You will not be disappointed. Let's jump to the end of production, where it turns out that the company that's funding this entire movie, well, guess what? They ran out of money. Ridley Scott delivered Alan Ladd a pretty damn good movie, and the production company didn't have money to pay for the processing of the film. Post-production drug on due to this lack of funding. There was no money for marketing because the people behind Path Entertainment were constantly lying. As I mentioned earlier, their finances were a complete shit show. Peretti, the guy behind the company, he eventually got arrested and was found guilty of multiple crimes, including misuse of corporate funds and fraud. What did this mean for Thelma and Louise? Well, the film got a delayed release until May of 1991, and they only had about 40% of their expected marketing dollars to promote the film. But some Something unexpected happened. The culture in America was primed to embrace Thelma and Louise in a way that nobody could really see coming. 
Thelma and Louise was advertised as a light-hearted female buddy action film. Nowhere in the trailer or poster did the film hint at the darker tones of the movie. Audiences had no idea that the movie would directly address social issues and tell the truth about the lives of women living in America. Audiences at early screenings gasped, clapped, and at times cheered after Louise shoots Harlan in the parking lot. Audiences were on board. They laughed. They were emotionally invested. But in the original screening of the film, Ridley Scott added an ending that varied from Callie's original script. Just a few short seconds of footage were added where you see the car with Thelma and Louise in it continuing to drive in the desert. It was intended to be a metaphorical survival, or so thought Ridley Scott, but instead audiences hated it. You can go find the clip online and see it for yourself. It's totally inconsistent with the lead up to the finale of this film, especially with the accompaniment of B.B. King's song, Better Not Look Down, playing in the background. The audience response was abysmal. They hated the ending. Ridley Scott and his crew scrambled. They cut off the last few seconds of the film as included in the original screening. They screened the movie again without that ending and everything changed. Audiences were on board from start to finish. Well... Some audiences were on board. The movie was released on May 24th, 1991. And guess what the number one movie that weekend was? Backdraft. <laughs> you heard that cast earlier. Clint Howard puts asses in seats, people. Number two at the box office was the Richard Dreyfus, Bill Murray cringe comedy, What About Bob? Followed by Bruce Willis and Hudson Hawk. Good God. And then came Thelma and Louise in fourth place. But the next week, it stayed in fourth place and it remained in the top 10 grossing movies for six straight weeks. Not too bad, considering it had some stiff competition from Terminator 2, Boys in the Hood, City Slickers, The Rocketeer, Point Break, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. The movie was a success, because people were talking about it to one another and in the media, and people wanted to see what all the fuss was about. Women gave the movie high praise as a representation of all the bullshit that they have to put up from idiot men. There were others who saw the movie as transformative violence, calling the heroines thoughtless people who committed aggressive actions to justify robbery and manslaughter. But let's be honest here, it was mostly conservative right-wingers who bashed the movie, and not surprisingly, the movie did not perform well with male audiences, especially those south of the Mason-Dixon line. Thelma and Louise was, as the New York Times' Janet Maslin called it, unfamiliar in the best possible way, and that the movie sees something other movies have not seen, because the men in this story don't really matter. Women found the film to be empowering, whereas some men criticized the movie for glamorizing the killing of men. Screenwriter Callie Curry later told The Observer that bad guys get killed in every goddamn movie that ever gets made. That guy was a bad guy and he got killed. It was only because a woman did it that there was any controversy at all. When it came time for Oscar season, Thelma and Louise received six Oscar nominations, including Best Director for Ridley Scott, Best Cinematography, Best Editing, a Best Actress nomination for both Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon, and a Best Screenplay nomination for Callie Curry. Filmmakers felt the fact that both Davis and Sarandon were nominated worked against the film as they may have split their votes. And the winner that year turned out to be Jodie Foster for her performance in The Silence of the Lambs. However, Callie Curry won an Oscar for her very first screenplay. The movie led to academics writing articles, examining its place in the history of cinema, comparing it to Easy Rider, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and Bonnie and Clyde. The movie inspired singer-songwriter Tori Amos to write and record Me and a Gun, a song about her survival of rape years earlier. Jessica Inneville's essay, The Daughters of Thelma and Louise, argues that the film attacks controversial patterns of chauvinist male behavior while exposing the stereotypes of male-female relationships and flipping the script on gender roles of the road trip genre of film. And in 2011, Raina Lipsitz called it the last great film about women, noting that women-themed movies have been losing ground. As for screenwriter Callie Curry, well, she went on to write the romantic comedy Something to Talk About, which received mixed reviews. She directed the film Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, which was incredibly well received. And later in her career, she developed the ABC country music series Nashville. Very well done. The Bechdel Test 
is named after cartoonist Alison Bechtel. It's a measure of how women are represented in film and other fiction. Passing the test requires a movie to meet three criteria. The first is that there must be at least two women in it. The second is that the women must talk to each other. And third, they must talk about something other than a man or men. And you get bonus points given if the women in the movie have names seems like a low bar, but a study from 2022 published in the Psychology of Popular Media, the Bechtel test results of the 1,200 most popular movies worldwide from 1980 to 2019 were presented. 49.6% passed the Bechtel test. But the 2010 share of movies passing were somewhat higher at 63% compared to previous decades. So some progress is being made. Some. You know what? Let's say we get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here, another middle-aged white guy, to talk about a movie we have no real justification to share our thoughts on to see if this movie is any good because it is very, very good. What are we doing here? Something's changed on Pick 6 Movies. You know what? Let's get this show on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, Pams and Callies, Pick 6 Movies proudly presents the 1991 groundbreaking film, Thelma and Louise. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the man who always drives me crazy, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? I almost started singing that Fine Young Cannibal song, and then I realized I can't sing. <laughs> this is going to be a very different discussion, because I think that this may be the best movie we've ever reviewed on Pick 6 Movies. I think that's easily true. I would argue we've done a, a handful of fun movies that we really got behind like invasion usa has been sort of the high watermark for me <laughs> because that's just a great time in watching a movie this is the first movie that we've done that feels like well all right now we've got a movie yeah I, we had had a steady diet of just pure garbage and this was a pick for me and i was like you know what i'm gonna order a salad for once i'm gonna do something <laughs> nutritious it, it's an interesting movie to do like you said in the introduction having two middle-aged white guys discuss one of the more prominent feminist films of the 20th century is is probably slightly inappropriate <laughs> but it's also a very good movie that's not to say that just because it's, it's a feminist movie that somehow drains how good a movie it is you know that the ideology of the movie sits very nicely alongside the movie i mean it's sort of that perfect symmetry of the movie has something to say and it says it in a way that is really entertaining and compelling and emotional it's a terrific movie you know it was nominated for a bunch of oscars it deserved to be nominated for a bunch of oscars it's beautiful to look at it's yeah i had such a good time watching this it was such a different note experience yeah. of going through this movie a couple of times and really seeping <laughs> myself in it in a way that i'm used to doing with like your masters of the universes most of your notes didn't begin with the words why how <laughs> what the <laughs> right yeah i mean i really only have one problem with this movie there's one scene in this movie that i'm like i don't like this at all i have one and it may be the same one we'll see if we align on that because we have not discussed this movie at all no and this is the first time that Bo and i have ever met so uh it is a pleasure mm -hmm. meeting you sir it is nice to meet you as well i have heard good things <laughs> let's start this movie off with some opening credits we see that susan sarandon and gina davis get tired top billing above the movie's title as they should then a parade of supporting actors male actors harvey keitel michael madsen christopher mcdonald Stephen Tobolowski. Tobo. Yeah, I didn't mention him in the intro. The intro was pretty long. I was like, we can talk about him as we get through the film. And Brad Pitt. After Tobo, by the way, which is the only time that has probably ever happened where Stephen Tobolowski is name above Brad Pitt in the credits. And also, right off the bat, Chad, I, you know, I know you're not a big fan of, of credit sequences like this where it's just names and some scenery, but thematically, it's on point yes. because you start off with a black black and white look at the landscape that slowly fades into color yes 
And I like that these opening credits, they don't stick around too terribly long. Lead actresses, title, the supporting actors in the film. You get a handful of people who did music and editing, and then they go on. Like, you don't get a whole bunch of this bullshit of executive, executive producer, and this other person, and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, that their contract said that they had to have their names before the movie actually starts. So yeah, I agree. This feels like a wonderful opening to this movie. The movie kicks off proper, and we see Louise working as a waitress in a diner. It's all very busy. She's wearing a traditional like diner waitress uniform with the apron and the tiny white hat. It's all very put together. And Louise walks over to two younger women who are both smoking cigarettes, as you did in movies in the early 90s. And she fills up their (laughs) coffee cups. And Louise says, you two are too young to be smoking. It'll ruin your sex life. Immediate cut to Louise in the back of this diner, smoking a cigarette in the kitchen. That's right. It is a wonderful visual joke to kick things off. It's the whole do as I say, not as I do. And I also love the fact she's the kind of waitress who'll go in the back of a diner and openly (laughs) smoke in the kitchen. It gives her a little bit of salt saltiness right off the bat like you said that she's the kind of person who is going to be somewhat maternal and sort of warn these young women that they shouldn't be smoking but like you said it's a uh, do as i say not as i do but it gives her that little bit of protectiveness that will pay off later in the movie can you imagine audiences who went in to see this film thinking it was going to be a traditional buddy comedy but with two female leads i mean right here it's lulling you into a false sense of we're all going to have a good time. The next thing Louise does is call Thelma, as played by Gina Davis, and we establish the premise, which is, hey, we're going on a road trip, and Louise is asking, like, well, what'd Daryl say? Thelma's like, well, you know I haven't talked to Daryl yet. When it cuts to Thelma, this movie is so good at showing and not telling, mm-hmm. because in her house, like, in the first 10 seconds of seeing Thelma, you know everything about her. Her home is chaotic and disorganized. She's in the kitchen. The counters are covered with everything about imaginable there are multiple pages of store coupons tacked up to cork boards she's like fresh out of bed wearing a bedrobe and when she runs to answer the phone she gives it the old school i got it i got it like that <laughs> that scream that you did when you didn't want anyone else in the house to pick up the phone <laughs> it was completely suspect when you did that here when thelma says she has not asked her husband daryl if she can go on this trip it's louise who says you haven't asked him is he your husband or your father it's too Two days for Christ's sake. Right. The script is so tight. There is not Mm -hmm. a line of dialogue or a tiny detail that is unnecessary. It is all on point and it helps to either grow the characters or move the plot forward aspiring screenwriters take note those are the two things your script should be doing not dicking around having a montage of wacky nonsense louise has to go back to work thelma hangs up and in walks as as you pointed out shooter mcgavin her husband she shouts out for him she's like daryl and when he comes in he is easily the goofiest man in this movie when he marches into the scene in their house which is under construction you see on the counter a proudly displayed bowling trophy and daryl says god damn it (laughs) Thelma, don't holler like that. I can't stand you when you holler like that. And all the while, Thelma is helping him to fasten what you can assume is fake gold jewelry around his wrist. Like it's this oversized watch and this big gaudy bracelet. Well, and (laughs) interestingly, it's not as if he is her father. It's more like she is the mother. That she is just constantly taking care of this guy. I love in this scene, there are two moments that Thelma tries to muster up the courage to ask Daryl if she can go on this trip. I mean, you see her wind up and then backs off and winds up and backs off. And the second time she just pivots and she's like, "Hun, is there anything special you want for dinner? And Daryl says, no, I don't care what we have for dinner. And I may not be home for dinner. You know how Friday nights are. And she <laughs> makes the point of like, I, you know, it sure is weird that people want to buy carpets on a Friday night. Usually that's something they won't worry about on the weekend. Well, that's why I'm the regional manager, Thelma. <laughs> and he spins his keys that are attached to his hip on one of those little zip lines like he's a gunslinger. He's so proud of it. It's so good. Daryl is a character that everyone has met in real life. And if you've never met Daryl before, you're probably Daryl. right he is completely full of himself he's he's the typical southern big fish in a small pond he wears a gold chain around his neck with the number sign and a one like he's number one when he walks out of his house he gets in his red corvette that has like an open t-top and his arkansas license plate says the and then number one so it's the one and on his way out daryl slips and just falls ass first on some loose construction board and he recovers enough to tell the two 
workers. He's like, I want you all out of here by five, no, three. And he, you know, he gets in his car and he speeds off. And because I read that book on the making of this film, this was, it was an accident that he fell. And for Christopher McDonald, he does such a good job of taking his real life slip and just spinning it into comedic gold. It's so wonderfully done. He's such a buffoon. Once he's out of the picture, at least temporarily, Thelma calls Louise back. And by the way, we're not missing it in the scene. She never asks no. him for permission or anything. She just calls Louise louise back and says we're going to the mountains i'll be ready by 2 30 as she's talking to louise here i don't know if this was just great direction or if this was an acting choice by gina davis but as they're having this conversation thelma is eating a candy bar one bite at a time but every time she takes a bite she puts it back into the freezer i don't know if i noticed that that's wonderful it, it just adds to her being this quirky unorthodox superficially scatterbrained person that would do something this unusual thelma asks louise what should I bring? And Louise says, bring warm stuff. It's the mountains. And then she says, steal Daryl's fishing stuff. And Thelma says, but I don't know how to fish. To which Louise responds, I don't either, but Daryl does it. How hard can it be? And <laughs> right. one, it's a great joke. Uh -huh. But I also like that Louise says, steal his fishing stuff, not grab his fishing stuff or take or pack or borrow or any other word. She says, steal steal his fishing stuff it's again one of those little details when looked at it as part of the whole it's like oh this all makes sense and it also shows that she thinks that thelma's oaf of a husband is just a complete clod which he is louise has very definite opinions about daryl and none of them are good <laughs> no. there's a scene we'll get to later where they're talking to brad pitt and her description of daryl is fantastic <laughs> louise leaves her job at the diner and she hops into this seafoam green 1966 t-bird convertible mm -hmm. not a car that is easy to forget we see each of our film's protagonists start to pack for this trip thelma is literally just dumping things into her suitcase from her chest of drawers whereas louise is literally putting pairs of shoes inside plastic bags almost alphabetizing her clothes as she packs. This is the montage of them packing that I really like where it tells you everything about their personalities. Yeah, Louise is also wearing this black short-waisted coat and it has this bold white stitching on the lapels. This is important because as these two women go through let's call it like a metamorphosis or just the change over the next few days, there's a moment where this jacket is worn by Thelma and not Louise. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those small details that this movie is filled with. One other significant moment in this is is that Thelma takes a gun from a drawer and puts it in her purse. You say takes. She uses her index finger and her thumb and pinches it like a claw machine, you know, and then drops <laughs> it in her bag. <laughs> Again, showing that her decisions may not be the best or her being overly naive. We also do see Louise calling someone named Jimmy and she gets his answering machine, which is how we know his name's Jimmy. But we also see her very subtly turn over a photo of a man that we are assuming is Jimmy as she gets the answering machine message. Again, building up to so much more that's coming throughout the rest of the film. Louise eventually pulls up to Thelma's house and Thelma comes out and loads multiple pieces of luggage and all kinds of fishing equipment. I mean, it's real scatterbrained what she's bringing out. And before the two hit the road, they snap a Polaroid of themselves smiling and happy. Yes. Which is now a very iconic moment in this film's history because of how it ends and, you know, the two of them, mm -hmm. where they start and where they ultimately end up. When they get in the car, when, once they're taking off on the trip, Thelma hands over the gun to Louise, who's like, what in the fuck do you want me to do with this yeah. thing? She says, come on, Louise. There might be psycho killers or bears or snakes. The, another thing I love about this moment, when she tells Louise, hey, I brought this gun to protect us from these crazy things, Louise says, just put it in my purse. So now we, the audience, know that Louise is aware of a gun and has easy access to the gun. We know that they're headed to some fishing cabin that's owned by Louise's boss, who's going through a divorce i like that her boss a man is going through a divorce but to screw over his soon-to-be ex-wife he's letting everyone who works at the diner just go up to this place in hopes they will burn it down no doubt or just whatever before he has to turn the keys over i think is how she says it it's another like not even a background character it's a character that's being talked about of just being a shitheaded guy doing shitheaded guy things there's two good guys in this movie there are two men who display honorable behavior. 
I don't know. <laughs> yes, and the rest are, are shitheads to one degree or another. And I don't think that is reverse sexism or whatever you want to say. Most of the guys in this movie behave like most guys. They're genuinely idiots. Yeah, but I think that counts. I think most guys are kind of idiots. And, and you have two of ten in this movie. Two of ten that at least operate with honorable intentions. <laughs> Even if that doesn't necessarily always go well. But to that point, this is where we get Thelma's reveal of like, oh, I never asked Daryl. I left him a note and, you know, um, his dinner in the microwave. She also says, I ain't never been out of town without Daryl. And Louise asks her, like, well, how'd you get him to let you go? Well, I didn't ask you. Mm -hmm. At least here, Thelma is breaking free from this role of being a dutiful housewife. Louise laughs with approval and says, well, you get what you settle for, which was a line that in the introduction that the film mm -hmm. screenwriter, uh, Callie Curry, used, you know, regularly. And I don't know that I can necessarily disagree with that. I think that's absolutely true. And Thelma of the two characters has the bigger arc through the film louise definitely does have an arc but hers is sort of down and then up again whereas thelma is very much the character that's the more dynamic metamorphosis through the movie and says some really interesting stuff that we'll talk about yeah. later on but i think that just how their relationship changes but it doesn't feel forced or heavy-handed for as much that mm, happens no. in this movie i don't know that allegorical is the right word or that it's you know being presented in a unrealistic way there's a very symbolic yeah. quality to this and we'll get deeper into that but uh there's a, a really funny moment here i think j again to illustrate louise's character where gina davis just throws her feet up on the mm -hmm. dash and louise is like what do you do put your feet down i think it's that she puts her feet up but she also she's wearing this long white dress thelma is and she raises mm -hmm. up her dress a little bit because they're in this convertible like lets the breeze go up her dress as well and it's not in a sexual way I'm, it's just more of letting loose and you see this I don't know if it's mother-daughter dynamic or bigger sister, little sister, or just someone who has a little more experience and maturity with someone who lacks that. Thelma is very naive in a lot of ways. I, again, getting to a conversation later, you know, she talks about how, like, not only has she never been out of town without her husband before, she hasn't really been with anybody but mm. her husband. It's like, she's, she's very yeah. sheltered. I like that she pretends to smoke like Louise, which, again, later in the movie changes like at first it's just her almost like a child mimicking the actions the cigarette she pulls out she doesn't light it she just puts it in her lips and mm -hmm. looks at herself in the side mirror and imitating louise she's like look i'm louise mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> smoking a cigarette and <laughs> yeah. louise just laughs at her as they drive along thelma begs for louise to stop off so that they can have some fun at this roadside bar in arkansas and louise objects but gives in because thelma never gets to do anything like this and they pulled off at this place called the silver bullet as the sun is going down and this is not the last time that louise gives into thelma's seemingly innocent request for fun during their trip that ends bad mm -hmm. inside the bar thelma and louise take a seat at a table and the waitress her name is lena she asks if they want a drink and louise says no thank you but thelma says i'll have a wild turkey straight up with a coke back <laughs> <laughs> yeah and louise who's kind of shocked by this <laughs> I, i've never seen you drink or you know it's been so long and louise then goes along with and orders a margarita with a shot of cuervo on the side that's how she one ups her but then thelma immediately raises the stakes because when they bring over that first shot she throws it back and orders another wild turkey shot we've all had those friends you know those people that don't get out very often and when they do mm -hmm. they go from zero to 60 immediately yeah i mean again she's sheltered she hasn't been able to do any of this like she went from high school to yeah. marriage i think she went from middle school to high school to marriage as they break it all out i mean her like you said being that friend that's just like all right everybody yeah. batten down the hatches this doesn't it. it's it's like the husband that goes to the conference <laughs> and gets loaded and everybody's like can you believe that terry fell asleep in the lobby he woke up while somebody was checking in the next morning that's the only thing that stirred him and it's that kind of thing of just like we're all gonna party tonight you know yeah who's with me yeah who's with me so enter into our movie harlan who is this tall arguably good-looking guy mm -hmm. that you would find in a place like this hitting on any woman and every woman harlan comes over and he says what are a couple of cupie dolls like you doing in a place like this and thelma immediately spills the details of their trip and louise just shuts this down with a cross look and again this will not be the last time thelma spills the details of their plans to 
a handsome man. He's very redneck charming because Thelma's like, oh, I got an uncle named Harlan. Harlan says, oh, is he funny? If he does, then we got uh, something in common. And you're like, ugh, this guy's just gross. Louise eyes this immediately. One, he's sitting backward on a chair like he's about to have a real heart to heart with some youth <laughs> about the dangers of doing drugs or something. I like that Louise, you know, having seen this particular routine multiple times in her life, just blows two full lungs of cigarette smoke into Harlan's face as this act of defiance. She's like, I think you need to leave because I need to talk about something real important with my friend. Right. Uh, Harlan, before exiting, he says to Thelma, you better dance with me before you leave or I'm never going to forgive you. And like you said, he's charming, but you get bad vibes from this dude. Thelma, again, being the innocent here, is trying to convince Louise, like, I just want to have some fun. I want to do some dancing. This is vacation. I never get to go on vacation. Let me have a good time. Harlan is sending drinks over yeah. to the table. Finally, they decide to do some dancing. So Harlan and Thelma pair off and Louise dances with some other dude who seems really bummed out when she leaves the dance later, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> Whereas like, a, oh, shucks. There's more dancing and drinking and dancing and drinking. Mm -hmm. And finally, Louise comes over to Thelma and Harlan, who are still dancing. And she says, hey, I'm going to go to the little girl's room. Then we're leaving. And Thelma says, okay, she's, you know, ready to go. But Harlan is just spinning her around and around and around to the point to where she says, stop. And Harlan says, well, let's get you some fresh air, little lady, because, you know, she's sweaty. We've all well i can't say we've all been in bars like this but even in a place where it's loud and it's hot and it's filled with cigarette smoke and it's just like you're drunk and it's like i gotta get out of this so when louise returns she sees that thelma's gone she pays the bar tab with lena the waitress and then outside in the parking lot is where we see thelma who is just thrown up she has a handkerchief and she's wiping off her nose and her mouth and her eyes and she says i'm starting to feel a little bit better now and harlan says you're starting to look a little better to me too mm. this is awful right this is where things start to head south because he's getting handsy with her thelma is like i was just sick Are you, you let me go he's very like don't be that way yeah kind of shit thelma pushes him off he sits her down on the trunk of a car he was like i'm not gonna hurt you i just want to kiss you and he leans in and he kisses her neck and she tells him that she's married and he's like well i'm married too mm -hmm. this is when she hits him and then he slaps her across the face and threatens look i'm not gonna hurt you this is where the movie takes its darkest turn from what started out as just this fun road trip into something that is way more violent and terrifying because he's spinning her around pushing her over the hood pulling her underwear down yeah he spreads her legs with his feet and she's just begging and saying you're hurting me this is where louise shows up to save the day she puts the gun that was in her purse again great screenplay because we knew this gun was in the car we knew it was in her purse suddenly louise is there with that gun well at first she says let her go and harlan responds get the fuck out of here then she puts the gun up to his neck and says let her go you fucking asshole or i'm gonna splatter your ugly face all over this nice car which i love this dialogue because she's dressing down this monster and also showing her appreciation for finer automobiles which we know she has because of the car she drives <laughs> it's oh it's so good thelma gets free because harlan stops with the gun in his face he says calm down we were just having a little fun right to which louise says looks like you got a real fucked up idea of fun and she says in the future when a woman is crying like that she isn't having any fun and susan sarandon's delivery of this line is so powerful you immediately know this isn't just about thelma being attacked by harlan absolutely i mean susan sarandon because we haven't said so yet a remarkable actress yes i love gina davis in this i have had a long-standing crush on gina davis <laughs> it is in full effect in this movie as well because i think she's like fun and vulnerable and sexy and all those things uh, but uh, susan sarandon like you said this delivery of this line of when a woman is crying like that she didn't have any fun it's like you said it just it mm -hmm. speaks volumes like you almost don't need all the other backstory about the texas yeah. stuff to know exactly what's going on here Thelma and Louise start to walk away and Harlan says bitch I should have gone ahead and fucked her and Louise says what did you say and Harlan responds I said suck my cock and Louise 
pulls the trigger and shoots Harlan in his chest, in his heart. Mm -hmm. We are 21 minutes into this movie that runs just a few minutes north of two hours. And for those audiences expecting a good time female buddy road trip, buckle up. We took a totally different turn than you were anticipating. Yeah. I mean, shoots him dead. He slumps against the car. After she shoots him, one important detail is that, yes, Louise says, go get the car. So Thelma runs to get their car and comes back and Louise is still staring at Harlan's body, sitting arguably lifeless on the ground. And Louise says to him, you watch your mouth, buddy. Mm -hmm. I only bring this up because Susan Sarandon was the one who chose to add this line because she did not want this to be a movie about violent revenge or vengeance. And the decision to have her say this line to Harlan as you know he lay lifeless on the ground, you watch your mouth, buddy. In her performance as Louise, it implies that Louise may not 100% be fully aware that he's dead right yes she shot him but she did not intend to kill him and by still talking to him there could be some inference that she thinks he may still be alive or if not that's not what it was about like she had no intention of killing him it's just that this circumstance led her to a place where the rage and anger yeah. took over Thelma and Louise they hop in their car and they drive off quite dangerously weaving in and out of traffic because Thelma's driving Thelma has has blood on her face from Harlan repeatedly hitting her. She's panicked and she says, Louise, where are we going? And Louise just quietly stares at the gun in her hands and she says, I don't know, just shut up so I can think. Thelma suggests that they call the cops, but Louise shuts that down immediately because she says the cops won't believe him because you spent all night dancing with Harlan at the club. And particularly says that we don't live in that kind yeah. of a world. I, again, one of the larger themes of the, of the movie is that just because Gina Davis was dancing with this guy and drinking with this guy it was somehow implicit permission for yeah. him to assault her or that she was asking for it or whatever like however you want to yeah. phrase that but that she would be seen as culpable not harlan they pull the car over and panicked it is now louise who is outside of the car vomiting for very different reasons Thelma moves back into the passenger seat. Louise is now driving again. It, it's such a tight script, but because she's kind of got her wits about her as much as they can be gotten. Thelma starts to brush her hair, doing something to bring normalcy to this chaos. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you can just see her like, what are we going to do? And Louise says, Thelma, I'm going to stop for a cup of coffee and get it together and figure out what to do. Everything's going to be all right. And just Thelma looks on, believing Louise, who reaches over and takes a scarf and just wipes the blood off of Thelma's face the way a parent would clean the face of a child. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm pointing out the obvious and hearing us describe this and, and give descriptions to actions, it doesn't communicate the same way, but it's so wonderfully done and it can easily go unnoticed. I think if you're not really paying attention to what's going on. Yes. And this movie, it has a number of these nice, subtle moments where the movie is not drawing attention to its the communication right. of its themes. Again, it's that perfect weaving of this movie is always saying something, but it does it in a number of different ways that aren't didactic. That's a problem with movies like this. Like another Susan Sarandon movie that I dearly love, mostly because of her performance, is a movie like Dead Man Walking, mm -hmm. which definitely crosses the line into to being didactic at times yeah but it's a beautiful performance in a beautiful movie i think but this movie the reason that people talk about thelma and louise still and less so dead man walking is because thelma and louise never forgets that it's a movie that's supposed to be entertaining you too and i think that ridley scott really got that that if you come in and you really have a message movie you may not be as effective is if you can put that into a narrative or you know a package that is to use your word entertaining or funny as much as it can be and still make a very serious point it's the anti-soul man is what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> right it, yeah it, like you can be a message movie or you can be a movie with a message and this is the latter, where it is a movie first and foremost, but the message that it has is so powerful that it just speaks volumes. So they go to this diner, and Louise is kind of going through this and saying, like, well, no one saw it. We're going to figure out what to do. They kind of blame each other here at the coffee shop, because Thelma is like, this sure is some vacation. It's a lot of fun, you know, because Louise was the one who invited Thelma. And Louise says, you know, if you weren't concerned with having so much fun, none of this would have happened. And Thelma's like, this is my fault? Yeah. 
the conversation stops because they're both aware of what each other is saying. The circumstance is creating this heightened sense of response to the situation in which they find themselves. And Thelma goes to the restroom and on her exit from the coffee shop booth, like her departure, the napkin pulls a coffee cup off the table and it falls and shatters on the ground. And Thelma's again, just in the hay, she's like, I have to go to the bathroom. I'm sorry. And it's so powerful because it's, it's something else that has gone wrong. It captures that sense of like chaos and destruction and the sound of it crashing it reflects sort of what their relationship is in the moment which is fractured they're not connecting at this point and to that point Thelma calls home she goes to the phone calls home to call Daryl who by the way has not been there on this Friday no. night and as evidence because we get a shot of the phone ringing in her house and there's the open microwave with a note still like on, on a beer yeah and there's a small stuffed teddy bear sitting on top of the Miller Genuine Draft and food in the microwave for him <laughs> to heat up. Yeah. And so then we go to our one of two decent guys in this movie. Harvey Keitel makes an appearance in the movie. First, we see Harlan being zipped up in a body bag. So we know he's he's dead, dead. Sure. And it's, yeah, Detective Slocum is played by Harvey Keitel and not his penis. I'm so glad to not see Harvey Keitel's penis in a Harvey Keitel movie. Much like me, though, I feel pretty confident that his penis is dressed up like a detective <laughs> as he is working Harvey, on the detective. Yeah, Harvey but... Keitel's penis is like his quato, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he consults it for sage yeah, advice. for sure. It's got a little face like, hey, what do you, uh, I'm thinking about doing this movie, Thelma and Louise there. Penis, what do you think? I think that's a great idea. You think? I think it's playing against type? I do, but I think it's going to be very successful. All right. No arguing with you, little P. So, Detective Slocum, he is talking with Lena, the waitress, and she says, I could identify him, but neither of them were capable of this. I could have told you Harlan Puckett would buy it in a parking lot. I'm just surprised it didn't happen sooner. And Detective Slocum asked Lena if she had any idea who might have killed Harlan, and she says, have you asked his wife? I hope she's the one who did it. Like, again, this guy's a piece <laughs> of shit. Yeah. She actually says, it was either some old gal or some old gal's <laughs> husband. This character of Lena the waitress has so much more depth than a character like this in any other movie. Any other character in almost <laughs> any movie we've ever done. And she's in it for two and a half seconds. And it's just like kind of hitting on Kaitel. Like, well, you going to take me for a cup of coffee? We can talk about this more. You just got to keep me up all night and ask me questions. Lena says that the shorter one, Louise with the tight hair, you know, she paid the bill and she left a huge tip. Of course she would. She's a waitress. Uh -huh. And then Lena and Detective Slocum, they have this playful goodbye. As you say, like, like it's in the middle of the night. A guy's been killed in the parking lot. And Lena says, neither of these two were the murdering type, Hal. And she's defending them. But there's almost an element of they might have done it. And I also like the fact that she calls him Hal. She knows him. This is a small town. Mm -hmm. Louise is calling Jimmy and gets the answering machine. So she goes to the bathroom and it's just her in there and Gina Davis is in the stall. And we know this because we see her purse sitting up on top of, it's a cement block wall. It's not like a stall you would see in a restaurant, like a thin mm -hmm. divider. These are cinder blocks stacked in paint. Yeah. This is a, that kind of an establishment. But I like that when Louise walks in, she knows Thelma's there because she sees her purse, but then out out loud, she says, Thelma, you in there? So that now Thelma knows Louise is in there. Right. Those little details, I was just in awe. Yeah, and Louise is cleaning herself in the mirror. Another great moment of like, they're both trying to compose themselves and establish some kind of normalcy. And while Louise is straightening herself in the mirror, there's a little spot of blood on her face that she finds. Yeah. And she kind of wipes it away and freaks out a little uh, about it a little bit quietly. She's not losing her mind, but clearly is the, the reality of this kind of comes crashing yeah. home again and they just they yeah. hit the road the sun's coming up and thelma is letting the breeze of the open windows brush up her legs again with her feet on the dash and she's just in shock louise says we need money how much do you have she says we can stop at a hotel room and i'll figure out what to do next and thelma fishes around in the pockets of her dress and she pulls out some crumpled up bills and she counts them out and she's like uh we have 61 dollars shit 41 dollars because the wind snatches a 20 and blows it out the window. <laughs> it is yeah. so funny. It's just one of those what else could possibly go wrong moments. And it also foreshadows what happens later that Thelma can't keep money. It's so good. 
So they go to a motel. Louise is in a towel, like, coming out of the shower. Of course she would, Bo. She just found a tiny speck of this guy's blood on her face. Yeah. I've got to get clean. Thelma is having a, a good old-fashioned meltdown because she's like, I want to go, go to the cops. We don't have any plan. What are we going to do, Louise? And Louise is like, I don't want to go to jail. And that's, that's what's in front of yeah. us right now. Why don't you go down to the pool? I'm going to try to figure mm-hmm. something out. And, and so that's what Thelma does. She, Thelma goes to the pool. Louise calls Jimmy, as played by Michael Madsen. How good is he in this? It's shocking how good he is. He's been good in other roles, but there's something about this role and the chemistry that he has with Susan Sarandon that is just tragically beautiful. Yes, he, there's something, I think you use the word vulnerable in the introduction with him, and that's kind of that character. We don't know a lot about him, but we kind of know everything we need to know, and, and there's a lot of depth there. Mm-hmm. You know, she basically says like, hey, I've got $6,700 in the bank. I can't get to that. Can you wire that to me and i can't tell you why he asked her he's like what's going on you know she says i'm in deep shit i'm in deep shit arkansas and he you know he kind of escalates his questions as to what's going on and she just says look something happened i can't tell you what just that i did it and i can't undo it yeah she's like, will you help me please and her performance on the phone this is oscar nomination just right here because she is fighting back so many emotions fear and sadness and you know her like everything that comes with her relationship with this boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend he agrees to send her the money he doesn't demand to know anything else he says okay i'll take care of this when you see jimmy in this scene he's wearing one of those sleeveless undershirts and he's in this apartment that's pretty run down but in the background there is a speed bag that boxers use mounted on the wall there's a guitar sitting on the floor leaning up on the other side of the wall during this conversation as you said you don't know a whole lot about this character but the movie is so masterful in giving these brush strokes of either their history with one another these physical representations of who this character is we learn a little bit about him later but not again not a ton and louise just asks him like do you love me and he kind of balks for a second and then he says yeah and she says never mind just wire me the money yeah she needs help she needs someone she needs jimmy and then she just immediately mm-hmm. shuts this down is like just give me the money but he comes through you know that's the thing is that um, uh, most of the, the men in this movie disappoint the women around them to no yeah. end jimmy is the one guy that at least comes through and and wants to help i like when thelma goes down to the swimming pool you see her walking down there and she's pulling her suitcase behind her by the strap uh-huh and by the time Louise goes to pick her up. Thelma is full on sunbathing by the pool with headphones on. Let me also say that this swimming pool has about a 10 foot chain link fence around it. And in the background, you can see 18 wheelers barreling down the interstate. One of the things that's really fun about this movie is every motel, every gas station is just some rundown place along the side <laughs> of the road. It, it Like it is southwestern kind of white trash living. Louise jumps out of the car, runs over, removes Thelma's headphones. and She's like, we got to go. So Thelma just jumps up in her bikini grabs her heavily overpacked suitcase chunks it in the back seat of the car boom they're off which apparently this was sort of not unscripted but gina davis was not prepared for susan sarandon to come (laughs) rip those headphones off of her in the scene and so her reaction of like being startled is is genuine cut to detective slocum talking with one of his superiors who says even if they didn't commit the murder they may have seen something put it on abp for their car see what we can get back they left the state we may need to bring in the bureau on this we cut to Thelma and Louise. They're driving, and Louise tells Thelma that they're going to Oklahoma City to get money from Jimmy. And Thelma tells Louise that she tried to call Daryl at 4 a.m. the night before, and quote, that asshole wasn't even at home. He has no reason to be mad at me. I should be the one who's mad. And as you mentioned earlier, this is where you begin to see this blossoming of her once she has been removed from the only world in which she has ever known, despite the fact that the world she is now entering into is right rife with temptation and danger and now consequence when louise says i'm going to mexico what are you gonna do and thelma doesn't answer like she is 
unwilling to commit to any course of action right now, which is understandable, right? Like, if you just showed up on my doorstep and were like, look, some shit went down. I got to go to Mexico. Are you in? Well, what she says in this state of confusion is, I don't know what you're asking of me. And Louise says, God damn it, Thelma, don't do this. Every time we get in trouble, you go blank or you plead insanity or or some such shit. Not this time. Things have changed, but (laughs) I'm going to Mexico. And what I loved about this dialogue was every time we get in trouble, you go blank or plead insanity or some such shit. Again, giving the backstory of these two characters conceptually that they have history together. And because they've known each other all their lives or, you know, since they were teenagers, for sure. Like she knew Daryl back in the day. Again, I don't know if the, the script explicitly says this, that she's however many years older than her. But I do like that they have history and you know that. She pulls over at a hotel and she calls. Yeah. And he says that the money will be at this other hotel and the password to pick up the money is the word peaches. And she kind of laughs at that. And he says, I miss you, peaches. And she kind of gives him a great, like, he seems like an all right guy. He ultimately is. He doesn't do anything that's, well, he's a little bit violent. Excuse me. He's violent. But not towards her. I, <laughs> not yeah, towards her. He just can't control himself in certain circumstances. He's really frustrated by some of the stuff she says. But anyway, so so we've got money on the way. He kind of tells her like, hey, it was kind of difficult to get the money, but I got it for you. It's it's going to be at this place. Go, go pick it up. Thelma's inside this roadside store buying multiple tiny bottles of... Some smugglers, yeah. <laughs> and the store owner's like, ma'am, wouldn't you rather have, you know, the economy size? Referring to a normal bottle of booze. And Thelma's like, no, that's all right. Money's tight. Thelma mm-hmm. you know she again she is not good with money and she just continues to make decisions that are just thoroughly not thought out so Louise walks back and she passes this shirtless man wearing this red white and blue like handkerchief around his neck who's staring at her and Louise asks what are you looking at there is a real defiance in this moment that is more proactive than reactive toward men behaving badly in this movie it's the first time you really see that yeah so Louise has Thelma called Derek. <laughs> while louise is going to go inside to get a newspaper because i she wants to see if there's any reports and she says just tell him you won't be home tomorrow night and thelma says well will i be and louise says well i don't know she says i won't right you still got to make that decision so she calls oh daryl god who is watching a football mm. game surrounded by multiple sports trophies that are proudly on display <laughs> in their home and a bunch of empty beer bottles the phone rings and the operator says collect call from Thelma will you accept and there is a (laughs) pause and he says why yes I will accept operator (laughs) Thelma where in the (laughs) Sam Hill are you (laughs) and she starts explaining what's going on not the the shooting we're at a fishing trip and we're going up here just for a couple of days and then dude he can't focus even this long the attention drifts away from whatever she's saying back to the game he covers the mouthpiece on the phone to scream his displeasure of a call in the football game (laughs) rather than listen to his wife he finally gets back and he's like Thelma you get your butt back here now god damn it he says Daryl you are my husband and not my father. Again, echoing mm-hmm. Louise's comment earlier. And Daryl says, that Louise is a bad influence on you. If you're not back here by tonight, again, another pause, then I just don't, I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, I don't know what's going to be. And it, cause he's just full of shit, right? Like he has, he's just completely impotent in every way. And <laughs> well, then Thelma says, go fuck yourself, Daryl. He's just left holding the receiver. He's like, that's just great. Coming out of this phone booth, she runs into the f- fucking adonis that is a young brad pitt literally trips over him i mean he's really like something a sculpture you would see in a museum it's crazy but that we'll get to the scene later where he's got his shirt off but holy you know what shit. else is great about this you can see those trademark brad pitt affects in this early performance just that easy go and charm where he's like i'm sorry darling he's like did i cause that are you okay he's charming white trash in this it's a very quick encounter at first but then thelma gets in the car and is kind of doing her makeup in the rear view mirror and she is totally checking brad pitt out as he's trying to hitch a ride behind her yeah well he's wearing like a canadian tuxedo blue jeans a blue jeans jacket a white t-shirt uh-huh canadian tuxedo and uh-huh. a cowboy hat he's dressed like ros dower from the mst 3000 episode <laughs> but it's a pretty all-american midwestern look and as she adjusts her mirror to look back at brad pitt he walks over to her sitting in the car and he's like 
Excuse me, ma'am. I was uh, wondering which way you were headed. See, I'm headed back to school. My ride fell through. And if you're going my way or if I'm going your way, maybe I could get a ride with you. It's 100% grade A bullshit. Absolutely. Naive Thelma. She's like, I think we're going to Oklahoma City. It's like, well, wouldn't you know it? That's where Brad Pitt's headed. Of course it is. <laughs> She's totally bought it. Louise rolls up and is like, I don't think this is a good idea. <laughs> She's seen this shit before. With <laughs> Thelma, just the day before. Like, Thelma is just, like, all it takes is a pretty face, and she's, God bless her. Thelma is just kind-hearted and naive and also a little horny. I think that those are all true, but... Again, kind of the way that I said, you know, we've all known a Daryl. I think we've all known people like Thelma, men and women alike, just people that expect the best in other people. You know, yes. that they always default yes, yes, yes. that this person has good intentions, which I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, except for the fact that there are people that do not have good intentions and will take advantage of you. But she has not been outside of her very small world to be able to have a good bullshit detector. That's right. And so Louise gets in the driver's seat, hits the pedal to hit reverse on this goes backward drives like a stunt uh -huh. woman backwards to the gas station tell someone to fill up the tank at this rundown white trash gas station and then asks thelma about the conversation she had with daryl while thelma is sipping on one of the smugglers <laughs> She, yeah. thought. she says that she called Daryl and that Daryl said, hey, how are you? Are you having fun? You sure deserve this vacation. And she's, yeah, she's just g -g 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 pouring down this mm -hmm. So they drive on. Thelma starts commenting on Brad Pitt's cute butt, which I think everybody has done that a time or two. And how Daryl has a butt so big you could park a car in its shadow. <laughs> right. And Louise asks Thelma to find all the secondary roads from Oklahoma City to Mexico on a large map and Thelma says hey we can take 81 down through Texas and Louise immediately says no I'm not going through Texas find another route in a tight script like this you know this has greater meaning and Thelma points out the border between Texas and Mexico is huge and Louise just demands she finds another way she's not going to go through Texas and this whole exchange happens as a train rumbles by adding noise and motion and at the same time kind of representing the large obstacles that present themselves in their final destination Thelma is also asking like what happened in Texas I know something happened there and Lu Louise kind of deflects by saying shooting a guy with his pants down and getting caught for it in Texas is not the place right. to do it there are a couple of other little things here are actually one of them not so little but in part of this is when they first get in the car after <laughs> Thelma gets the smugglers and has run into Brad Pitt that's the first time where she says how long before we're in Mexico to sort of suggest that uh, she's yeah. bought in now and there's also a very quick cutaway where we see harvey keitel going through registered car owners so you know that he is still on the hunt but it's a scene that lasts for like three seconds we've had this happen on other episodes where you just forget a character's in the movie because this is such a well-made film even having just a six to twelve second clip of him going through those cars it reminds you where he is and his place in in this sort of parallel investigation that's going on as opposed to just having him show up and and sort of advancing the idea too that he's looking for the pursuit yeah. is on we also see him breaking into louise's place with a credit card well slocum shows up harvey Keitel. he shows up he kind of peeks in the window and sees that the apartment is empty and then he does that hollywood trademark you know slide the credit card in and in you go he looks over and he's examining the photos and one of the things that he says that i almost felt a little out of place or i thought it was going to maybe come up later is he looks at a photo of louise and he says happy birthday lady i initially mm -hmm. took that as an implication that is today her birthday or was it just that the photo was of her as a child at a birthday party i think that's the case thelma and louise are driving along and they're singing at the top of their lungs the way you do the things you do this is really mm -hmm. the first moment in the film where we went from kind of this drab, dust-covered beginning of the film. You know, it was like Grapes of Wrath or something. And here, you start to see the lush greens start to appear as part of the foreground and background of the, the landscape that they're traversing. Kaya Tells talks to the manager of Louise's Diner. It's just a, another of those quick scenes of letting you know he's on the trail of Thelma and Louise. I like when the detective is in this diner. He 
says that he's looking for Louise. And the assistant manager turns around and screams out, Marion, there's a police officer here. And everyone in this, <laughs> in this place stares at the detective. It's a funny scene, which again is necessary to balance out the heavy themes in this movie. Speaking of, one of the funnier moments uh, for me in this movie is Thelma and Louise on the road. Somehow or another, Brad Pitt has gotten ahead of them in his hitching rides. Well, they're taking back roads yes and he's traversing the main highways and byways of these united states as they see him thelma gives this like puppy whimper yeah and louise gives in again and says all right and then when she does thelma pants uh, like said dog like <laughs> oh i'm about to get me some love it sure enough they pull over brad pitt gets in and they they take off we cut back to detective slocum and he is now talking to daryl at daryl's house and slocum says a man was shot at the silver bullet last night two women left in a 1966 t-bird convertible from the scene of the crime that car is registered to one louise sawyer and we believe that your wife thelma was the passenger in the vehicle and daryl's response is what what <laughs> it's very like christopher mcdonald has good comic chops and he's really hamming it up in this movie it's crazy because i only know him from this and happy gilmore i'm sure he's been in many other things i mentioned in the intro that he and gina davis were dating they were a couple then she left to go have a relationship with jeff goldblum and when she recommended him for this part when the scene occurs where he crosses paths with brad pitt that it was almost cathartic for him screaming at brad pitt being the guy who had sex with gina davis in yeah. this movie and you can see it man he's about to explode in that scene and we'll get to it in a minute but it's just tying together pre-existing relationship with what's happening on the camera mm -hmm. and you can see i don't know glimmers of it here and there if you know what to look for also Kaitel ends the scene by laughing at him rightfully and he also says uh, you're standing on your pizza box standing in your pizza yeah. <laughs> which is exactly what's going on i think there are a lot of scenes in this movie where harvey Keitel and chris mcdonald and later steven tobolowski they're laughing at each other because they're genuinely making each other laugh i think that's true i think his what what you're definitely seeing harvey Keitel laugh at him then delivering the line you're standing in your pizza Mm -hmm. if i remember correctly there's like multiple pizza boxes that he's just been ordering out while his wife isn't there completely helpless <laughs> like he cannot cook his own food or clean the house or anything like that there are beer bottles all over the place <laughs> it's it, right it's like if you leave me alone for a weekend with no supervision <laughs> So we come back to Thelma and Louise and Brad Pitt, and he is playing Thelma like a violin. He says to her, tell me, Miss Thelma, how is it you don't have any kids? God gives you something special. You should pass it on. <laughs> Thelma, of course, is like, well, you know, Daryl didn't want any. He said he kind of prides himself on being a little childish anyway. Louise is like, oh, yeah, he is. That guy is terrible. And Thelma says, well, I think it's because Louise thinks he's a little bit of a pig. Louise <laughs> says, oh, I know he's a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Thelma does say that they were married at 18 and then uh -huh. it comes out that she was dating him four years prior to that marriage right and again that's what I said earlier it's middle school to high school to where her life is now and then JD who he and Louise they've got a, a lot more worldly wisdom than Thelma does JD says uh, you better slow down Miss Louise there's a cop up ahead and Louise not only slows down but she pulls off onto a side road to avoid being seen by the cops all together and as they drive by Louise kind of comes around and gets back on the main road and Brad Pitt looks at her and he says maybe you got a few too many parking tickets uh-huh and it's like he totally knows louise responds you know what when we get to oklahoma city you should probably be on your way <laughs> you know it, it's sort of a like game knows game kind of recognition <laughs> absolutely which i i dearly love meanwhile Kaitel calls up tobo our fbi we have one detective and one fbi agent right and steven tobolowski aka tobo is our FBI agent. Kaitel says, well, the prints on the back of that car match 
Thelma's. Mm-hmm. Daryl, the husband, has said that a gun is missing too. And Daryl doesn't believe that Thelma would ever touch that gun. She never wanted to take any lessons or go to the shooting range. But they never showed up at the cabin they were supposed to go to either. Right. So things are looking pretty criminal when it comes to the actions of Thelma and Louise. Yes. We cut to Louise entering the motel to pick up the money that Jimmy wired to her at this Western Union location. And she gives the code name Peaches, but there's no money there. But surprise, surprise, Jimmy is there hiding behind a newspaper. That's how you hide in, in a movie, Bo. You get a mm-hmm. newspaper and you hide behind it. Louise is happy, dismayed, surprised that he's there. And then Jimmy immediately asks for a second room. He's like, put it on my credit card. Mm-hmm. So Louise and Jimmy go outside to Louise's car. And Thelma and Brad Pitt are in the back seat of this car just talking. And Thelma looks up and sees Jimmy and she goes, oh, shit, it's Jimmy. What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> Jimmy says, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. And Thelma's response is, good answer. Same goes double for me. <laughs> uh-huh. And Brad Pitt, since he like, I should probably get while the getting's good. <laughs> decides to take off well i think that jimmy's is the jealous type because he's immediately like who's the cowboy and louise jumps in he's like he's gone and that's where jd's like yeah i'm, I'm out of here <laughs> and, but as they're driving through the parking lot to the room and brad pitt's walking away thelma looks back at him through the back window of this convertible just like <laughs> pressed against the glass yeah she says i love to watch him leave she's got it bad for brad pitt <laughs> and it, understandably so it's brad pitt wearing yeah. tight jeans walking away in the rain i mean it looks like an early 90s Levi's commercial. So yeah. in the hotel room, Louise gives Thelma the envelope containing the $6,700, and she says, it's our future. And Thelma and Louise have this back and forth about what Louise is or isn't going to tell Jimmy as Louise changes clothes. And she puts on this white tank top, somewhat similar to what Jimmy was wearing earlier, but she is very stripped down from the waitress uniform that she was wearing. And Louise tells Thelma, guard this money. If anything happens, call me in room. 211. That's so right. Louise heads over to room 211 and Jimmy answers the door and he's holding a single red rose. She comes in, he offers her a drink, she declines, and Jimmy asks, What's going on? And she just says, I'll tell you someday, but not now. And then Jimmy leaps to the question, does this have to do with another man? And in his frustration, as she is holding back, he just knocks over some items on the table. And he says, what, you're going to leave for fucking ever? What, did you kill somebody? And she says, you start this shit and I'm out of here. And then Jimmy, he just puts his hand on the door and he tells her that he's sorry. And Jimmy is a character that is not unfamiliar with violent behavior. And you really see that he cares about her, but there's nothing that he's going to be able to do or say to not, you know, to prevent her from leaving yes he just feels frustrated at this point like you can see it in his actions and on his face and he just says hey can will you at least sit down i just want to give you something yeah and louise is like no i'm gonna stand he's like okay i mean whatever whatever you want to do and hands over an engagement ring Mm -hmm. and she says well why now he says because i was afraid i was gonna lose you and i thought it's what you wanted at this point she does sit down with him and she says this is what i want i do want this but not like this while this is going on this kind of human drama is happening between jimmy and louise thelma gets a knock at her door Mm -hmm. because brad pitt has shown up to come sniffing around again he's like (laughs) you know miss thelma i'm just not having any luck getting a ride in that rain and she's like well you better come in then he's like well if you don't mind i don't want to interrupt you or anything <laughs> they start playing that hand slap game where you put both of your hands out and someone puts their hands under yours face up and you try to whip around slap them as they pull away again being like children mm-hmm. and at one point brad pitt says you know you, you got an unfair advantage you got too much weight on this hand and he just slowly pulls her wedding ring off and he drops it in a plastic cup half full of booze and he says ain't that better and i was like man i haven't seen some Something like this smooth since Nicolas Cage had his wedding ring removed by that prostitute's teeth and leaving Las Vegas. Right? He ends up <laughs> hopping in bed with her. Literally jumping up and yes. down on the bed like a couple of 10 year olds this is where Thelma kind of sniffs out like the one moment where she's at least a little bit savvy where she says like you're not a student are you and he's like well ma'am not exactly and <laughs> it comes out that he's a rob he says I'm, I'm probably just some guy who's parole officer he's having a shit fit right now I robbed a gas station and a liquor store and some convenience stores and she says how did you do it and he reluctantly stands up wearing nothing but jeans 
Holy shit, dude. I know. And he he puts a hairdryer in his waistband, kind of like a gun. And Brad Pitt just stands up and he gives this speech where he says, ladies and gentlemen, let's see who wins the prize for keeping their cool. Simon says, everybody down on the floor. Nobody loses their head. Nobody loses their head. You, sir, you do the honors of putting that money in the bag. You'll have an amazing story to tell your friends or a tag on your toe. You decide. And it's this very playful carnival barker type of a uh, entertaining robbery. Mm-hmm. And Thelma is just sitting on the bed, grinning ear to ear, spell bound by his performance and just drinking it all in and it's a romantic way to put it. i've been recently rereading still life with woodpecker so the word is sort of fresh on my mind but she says oh you're an outlaw aren't you which is a romantic way to describe someone who knocks over gas stations but he, and he jumps back <laughs> into bed with her and he says i may be an outlaw but you're the one stealing my heart right now miss <laughs> thelma and you're like god damn dude i like i want to fuck you now or, better yet just looking at him like you don't need to say anything right Right. Like, you don't need to be this charming to seal the deal. Yes. And she kind of teases him about it, and they kind of laugh about how much of a line it is, but she's still totally charmed by it. But meanwhile, in the other room, we'll get back to them in just a second, but <laughs> Louise and Jimmy are kind of having this heart-to-heart where Louise tells Jimmy, like, I love you, but we got to start letting go of old mistakes. There's a juxtaposition of a relationship coming to a close and one that's beginning. Yeah. Yes. And there's this wonderful moment. Man, I love this moment so much because it's the two kinds of love. It's that urgent, like we're just horny for each other kind of relationship going on in the next room. And there's this very mature human adult relationship happening between Louise and Jimmy. And she says, do you remember what you said to me the first night we met? And he says, I do. I said, you have a great pair of eyes. And she says, you remember what happened after that? And he says, yeah, you closed them and asked, asked me what color they were. And I didn't know. Yeah. And so she puts her hand over his eyes and says, what color are my eyes? And he pauses. Yeah. And in the audience, you're like, he doesn't know. But he, he, he does. Yeah. He says, he says brown. And uh-huh. then she kisses him. Yeah. Yeah. Susan Sarandon's delivery, when she just gently puts her hand over his eyes and she says, Jimmy, what color are my eyes? Uh huh. She's asking everything. Yes. With this one question. And he knows. He yeah. does. He cares about her. And meanwhile, in the other room, Chad, there is some good old fashioned urgent hotel fucking happening. Well, JD is seducing her in every way possible. And Thelma is completely into it. And it does proceed into some bouncing off the wall sex, which is fantastic. Again, as someone who has a deep crush on Gina Davis, that <laughs> moment where he's pulling her down the bed. Uh, which is you know pushing up her shirt and everything it's like this is sexy this movie got sexy all of a sudden but i'll tell you what it does not veer into the gratuitous scenes of movies of this era i think about the sex scene in top gun where you know you're just playing the love theme from that movie and it's a bunch of silhouetted tongues and mouths or you know you're seeing people topless for no reason other than just to see a naked woman or something like that this is much more purposefully done daryl has never done this in his life this is thelma (laughs) getting seduced properly by a man for the first time ever and it's brad pitt and it's it's a young chiseled (laughs) brad pitt made out of marble and charm right it's it's just like a how on earth would you resist this as you know again a woman who has spent her whole life being unfulfilled and trying to take care of a guy that's kind of an asshole to her yeah and sure enough the next morning louise wakes up jimmy's still asleep louise is kind of staring out the window she's about to leave for good yeah this is it and there's just looking at like a dude across the way skimming the pool of this shitty motel she and jimmy go down to breakfast finally he says look i don't know what you did but i'm not going to tell anybody why don't you hold on to that ring for a little while for me you can tell that she wants to tell him but also is kind of trying to protect him yeah from this yeah this taxi shows up to take him away and he says how about you give old jimmy a kiss she leans across the table and lays one on him man it is not the crazy passion of what was going on with Gina Davis and Brad Pitt. It's a kiss goodbye. But it's a kiss that lets you know, like, she loves this guy. Yeah. He leaves. She is very emotional. Like, she doesn't cry, but you can see the emotion on her face. She's got a lot on her plate, though. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, to say the least. And a waitress comes over, drops off the bill, and says, "It's good thing he left when he did. We were about to have to call the fire department." Given the same kind of sassy remark that you could have heard coming from Louise at the start of this movie. Absolutely, Thelma shows up. Oh my god, her hair is messed up. She is walking on air. The afterglow that <laughs> surrounds her. Gina Davis is so great in this moment. Yeah, I mean, just ear to ear, and she's like, "Do I look like something happened?" It's like, ask me, ask me what yeah. happened. I've got right. to tell somebody. <laughs> yeah, and Louise is of course very pleased that her friend and tells her says like, "I'm glad that somebody finally got you laid right." Yeah. <laughs> she says, "Wait a second, where is he right now?" And yeah. Thelma's like, "Oh, I left him alone to take a shower." And then Louise is like, "You did what? You left him with the money in our room?" And they go there. Brad Pitt's gone, as is the money. And this is the point where the roles really start to reverse in this yes. film. Because Louise breaks down. She's lost everything, man. I mean, she has nothing. Not just the money. She's lost Jimmy. She's not sure what they're going to do now. Thelma kind of recognizes in this moment, like, I have to be the strong one now. Well, at first she says, I'm sorry, Louise. It's okay. It's going to be okay. And Louise is like, no, Thelma, it's not okay. None of this is okay. And Louise is like on the verge of crying and laughing. I mean, she's just having a breakdown. Thelma just gets her up and drags her to the car. Yeah, it's a real drill sergeant. She's like, get up. It's going to be okay. Let's go. And yeah, that's the first time you see her proactive control of the situation. It will not be the last. We come back to Daryl's house and it's raining outside. They use rain machines a lot in this movie. I really didn't put a whole lot of thought as to why they use rain machines other than it makes movies look a little bit better, but they use them quite a bit. They show up at Daryl's house and it's a detective. I I think it might be just the contrast between here is the world of these men and their machinations and then the world of Thelma and Louise, which is bright and sunny and vibrant. It certainly could be. They get to Daryl's house and Detective Slocum's there and FBI agent Tobolowski and a few other men. And as they're going up to Daryl's house, Slocum and Tobolowski, they are racing each other like little boys. Yes, they are. As they're talking to Daryl, Tobo is like, look, we've tapped your phone. We're going to have someone at your house. And Daryl's like, what? You're going to do what? Is that, is that going to cost me extra? <laughs> And Kytel is like, listen, when Thelma calls, you got to let on like you don't know anything. And Tobo is like, yeah, you're going to want to be gentle and act like you care when your wife calls. Women love that shit. And then they all kind of have a laugh about women love that shit to let you know that these like as good as Kaitel is he's also still kind of a dirtbag the movie cuts to Thelma driving the Thunderbird and she is now smoking a lit cigarette taking on many of the characteristics that we saw earlier with Louise Louise is now in the passenger seat she's all but comatose Thelma pulls over in front of this roadside country store she puts on Louise's sunglasses and hands her cigarette over to Louise as Thelma runs inside this you know rural convenience store Outside, it simply just says market. Louise tosses the cigarette out. So she's no longer smoking. And she looks over and sees these two elderly women staring back at her from a nearby building. And one of them just smiles at Louise. I think this is a moment that can be interpreted countless ways. And the way I interpreted it, the way you interpreted it, I think the way women interpret this is is all going to be very different. Of having these yeah. older women looking at these younger women in this convertible on the road and what Louise makes of them and what they make of her. And it's a very quiet moment. And then Louise pivots and she reaches into a purse to put on her lipstick and she leans up into the rearview mirror and then she just stops. And just like the cigarette, she tosses the lipstick away. Not hard to read that metaphor. No, not at all. But what I also really like about this scene is that you see the progression of her character, but it is also spanning enough time to what is going on in the background that we do not have visibility into because this incredibly intimate moment of Louise continuing to grow and evolve as a person is interrupted by Thelma running from this general store screaming drive Louise drive start the car it sounds like (laughs) Indiana Jones yelling at Jacques you know Uh to get the plane moving (laughs) with all the natives behind him and it's clear that what's happened here is that Thelma has robbed this store yes And as they're pulling away, Louise is like, what did you even say? Thelma says, I just waltzed in there and said, cut to 
the security camera footage where Thelma is repeating word for word the speech that Brad Pitt gave earlier when he detailed his armed robberies. And again, I love the way this security footage bridges Thelma telling Louise the story and then the fact that we see our FBI agent, our detective, and Daryl watching this security footage. I like at the end of it too, like after giving this speech and getting the money, Thelma says, oh, and throw in some of those wild turkey bottles too. (laughs) And as they watch this, all the guys react with one blasphemy after another where one of them says jesus christ and another says good god and the other one says my lord we got to thumb and louise in their car riding down the highway and they are just screaming in exhilaration they've got some money they still may be able to make it to mexico then they get behind this 18 wheeler that is pulling like a long chrome gas tanker and as they pass it's got the naked lady mud flaps on them and as they go past the driver he like sticks out his tongue and flicks it at them he also has a naked lady air freshener on his rear view mirror <laughs> And yeah. Thelma and Louise are rightfully disgusted by his actions. One thing about the scene I love, just before they get to the trucker and his vile behavior, Louise is really laying down the pedal. And Thelma is like, why are you driving so fast? And Louise says, well, we got to put some distance between us and the scene of our last goddamn crime. <laughs> it's such a great line. <laughs> So they blow past this vile trucker. We see that Jimmy is getting home in the rain as well, and yeah. Arkansas State Police are waiting for him outside. Thelma and Louise end up at a gas station, kind of off the beaten path, and Louise walks over and sees this very old man. He looks like he's like 108. And she exchanges her jewelry, including her earrings, for this weathered cowboy hat that this old man was wearing. At this point, Thelma is now wearing blue jeans and a blue shirt that she has kind of tied up around her midriff and Louise is wearing the white tank top she had on earlier and she's not wearing anything underneath it and they have both really undergone this I don't say like physical metamorphosis but like their costumes have changed so dramatically from where they started to where they are in so many visible ways yes and here they're also parked next to train tracks again which I took as an important visual cue because they bring up the subject of texas because louise says i want you to call daryl and if he sounds suspicious his phone is tapped and she says we're wanted for murder and robbery and thelma says we'll just tell him that harlan was gonna rape me and that's why you shot him and louise explains the impossibility of this without evidence and cites how the law is not working in their favor and thelma asks how do you know so much about all of this again you know we have the train tracks and this visual about texas and her bringing up this past that she has in texas that she does not want to talk about and then Thelma asks Louise where did you get that cowboy hat and Louise says I stole it (laughs) yeah (laughs) so this is a a big man scene coming up where we have Brad Pitt being hauled in by the cops they haul him past Daryl uh-huh so at least Daryl knows who he is Kaitel and Tobo sit him down in a questioning room Kaitel is like Where'd you get the $6,600? Brad Pitt is like, oh, I just got from a friend, you know? Which means also it was originally $6,700. Yeah. So 100 is already gone. But yes. anyway, it turns out Jimmy has already filled in the cops on the money that he gave them. Finally, he asks Tobolowski, uh, he's like, can you give us the room a second? And so Tobo's like, sure, I'll be right outside. Kaitel gets up close on Brad Pitt and is like, so I just want to ask you one question. Do you think that Thelma would have robbed that gas station if you hadn't stolen all their money? And he's like, well, wait a second now. I didn't do anything like that. And Kaitel is like, shut up, shut up. Yeah. And he grabs Brad Pitt's hat and just starts beating him with his own hat. And he says, look, I will make your misery my mission in life if you don't give me something that might do those girls some good. Yeah. It's a really nice moment where, you know, it's Kaitel like, look, they're in trouble. Everywhere they've turned, somebody has done something fucked up to disappoint them. And I'm not going to be one of those people. Afterwards, Kaitel says, like, I want a word with Thelma's husband. And when Brad Pitt passes by, he goes, I like your wife. This is where Daryl loses his shit, wanting to kill Brad Pitt, who is at the bottom of like a half flight of stairs. And he just like pumps his hips in the air like he's fucking her. Daryl is straining to get away from these cops to have at this guy. Harvey Keitel said during the filming of this scene that it was like four dudes could barely hold Christopher McDonald back in this scene. I think he was working out some shit here. 
Yeah. <laughs> so Thelma and Louise stop for some gas at night. Oh, at a place that literally has two horses tied up out in front of it. We are way off the beaten path. They are not taking the main roads at all. Thelma goes to call Daryl and Louise reminds her, hang up if you think anything suspicious is going on. Thelma's like, okay. And so she dials and Daryl <laughs> picks up the phone and he goes, hello? And Thelma says, hey, Daryl. To which he says, hello, Thelma. Click. He knows. <laughs> right. It's it is a terrific gag. Louise calls back and Daryl answers and she's like, I want to talk to the police. And he's like, What? What do you mean? And she's like, Daryl, cut the shit. Just put the police on the phone. There's no police, just me and my trophies here. <laughs> and all the detectives around, they can hear all of this. And right. Kytel finally just takes it away. Like, he and Louise have this. You know, it's like these two characters that you've kind of been wanting to connect in some way, or at least for me watching. It was like, I'm looking forward to the two of them because she needs help. He wants to help. Let's see what this is. Yeah. That's what he says. He's like, look, I'm, I want to help you. She's like, I, I don't know that you can help me at this point. And she, he says, I'm not, I, I don't think you're going to get to Mexico. Yeah. She hangs up. And Louise storms out and starts yelling at Thelma about like, how did, how did he know about us going to Mexico? Did you tell Hunky Brad? pit about that and she's like well i did say that you know if he was ever in mexico he could look it up and she's like god damn it thelma and they get in the car and she says you know thelma we're fugitives now it's about time we start acting like it it's kind of that change in the movie where there is the idea that there is no going back from this yeah you know that there is never going to be a, a solution to this that involves them going to the authorities or depending on harvey Keitel or depending on jimmy or daryl or anything the only people they can count on is, is each other. This is also the scene where Thelma is wearing Louise's black jacket from earlier. Yeah. And you kind of see them becoming more equals, even though they're still maintaining the, their core characteristics and principles. But you see that growth that's happening as well. Thelma and Louise, they are now in Utah. And Thelma says that she always wanted to travel, but she never got the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. And the camera then shifts back and forth between Thelma driving and Louise driving again to to show the passage of time and then ultimately it's night and louise stops the car and she gets out and she just stares out into the expanse of the west and then thelma joins her and she says what's going on and louise says nothing to me it harkened back to her watching the guy skim the pool mm -hmm. just you know those moments where you're like you're dealing with a lot you know you're kind of looking at everything and nothing all at the same time there's a nice moment during the course of this where they cut back to daryl's house where all the men are sitting around watching a movie and daryl is stuck in the back of his own living room without a seat yeah and he tries to turn it to like a football game or something and all of the men just kind of look back at him he's like oh sorry and <laughs> turns it back to this movie that they're all watching daryl has been sidelined even in his own home yeah but back on the road during the day they pass by this filthy trucker again who honks and waggles his tongue again and just generally acts like an ass he says i'm your captain muff diver classy while the sun is coming up though thelma starts kind of cry laughing well, she, she's drinking more wild turkey in the <laughs> <Right>. a.m <laughs> like you do on yeah. vacation <laughs> And Having committed multiple crimes, sure. Louise asks what it what she's laughing about or what she's reacting to, and she says, That look on Harlan's face when he said, Suck my dick, he sure wasn't expecting that. And Louise is like, It's not funny. We don't need to think about this. And that's where she says again, like, What what happened to you in Texas? And Louise pulls the car over, stops the car, and is like you need to drop this. Whatever happened back then is whatever happened back then. We are not talking about this. So then she finally drives on after once again shutting it down. Thelma says to her, she says, that's what happened to you back in Texas, isn't it? You was raped. Yeah. And that's the first time she really confronts Louise with what happened in Texas. When Louise says, you know, drop it. I'm not talking about it. You know, do you understand? And Thelma backs off and she says, it, it's okay. And I think the it's okay there isn't just, it's okay that you don't want to talk about it. It's like, I, I understand you. Yeah. It's okay if you're angry about this. Yeah. And it's because, because again, I mean, like they, the bond that they have at this point is unshakable. Like for the rest of the movie, this is truly them acting as a partnership. Yeah. Up to and including this moment where they're a cop that pulls up behind her and flashes the blues mm -hmm. 
He's and this lo- young, good-looking dude. Yeah. He takes Louise, the driver, and asks for like her driver's license, and then he escorts her back to the patrol car. He puts Louise in the front seat passenger seat while he's in the front seat calling in her license, which, again, is really good because I don't think a cop would ever really do that, but he does it showing that he does not see her as a threat. You would not put a potential dangerous criminal riding shotgun in your patrol car. And he's not a terrible guy or anything. He's like, you know, they were doing 110 miles an hour. Right. And he is not acting inappropriately or anything. But Thelma shows up at the driver's side window with the gun and is like, I'm so sorry about this, but I need you to get out of the car because if you run that driver's license, you're going to find out we're wanted in two states. She commands Louise to take his gun. (laughs) <laughs> right and then shoots two holes in his tires and, and, and even louise is like what are you doing and she's like tires and then she tells her she says shoot the radio and then louise shoots the car radio <laughs> right. and she's like yeah. no louise shoot the police radio and she you know shoots the police radio and this is really the first time in the movie where louise's behavior is less focused like she's doing something that isn't clearly thought out and veers into the, you know, are you a dummy kind of category? Why would I have you shoot the radio that plays music? Shoot the police radio so he can't communicate. Yeah, I think there was a part of Louise that was like, okay, we're, this is over now. As soon as he runs this, I'm done. <laughs> I could see that. She's in a different state of shock of like what's coming next. Right. She, yeah. Like her mind is on, I'm going to, because when, when they go to the car, she asks him, do you want me to get in the back or the front? They shoot out the radio. And and then Thelma walks into the back and shoots a couple of holes in the trunk of the police car. They open the trunk of the police car and this officer is begging them to like, don't do this because I'm, I'm sure he's thinking he's going to be executed or at least roasted alive in the trunk of his car out in the middle of the desert. As they put him in the trunk of this car, one detail that I like is that Louise reaches in there and there is a six pack of Miller beer in the <laughs> trunk of this officer's car. They put him in the trunk. The officer says, I've got a wife and kids. And Thelma says, will you be sweet to your wife? My husband wasn't sweet to me. Look how I turned out <laughs> right <laughs> Louise has the presence of mind to get his belt so he, and she's like extra ammo and yeah. was like oh yeah good idea like, and, she, <laughs> and she takes his sunglasses she trades her sunglasses for his because I guess his look better but they're really polite about it. like I'm real sorry about this and they put him in the trunk there's a moment that happens later where Thelma is like you know I think I'm really getting the hang of this and yeah. <laughs> Louise is like you are you are good at this And this is really the scene that solidifies Thelma as being more aggressive and taking command of situations. Earlier with robbing the market, that could have been a one-off. Here, to your point of referencing her dialogue, she's pretty good at this. Not only has a knack for it, enjoys it. Like, enjoys living this life where she's outside the bounds of society. You know, like they both are. And we get a moment where Tobolowski and Keitel are talking about them going on this crime spree. Tobo's like, I can't figure out out if they're real smart or real lucky and Kaitel says it doesn't matter smart only gets you so far and luck always runs out good line it, it's terrific and it also starts because we're coming to the end of this movie now yeah and it's starting to build to that point of like how do they get out of this you know what i mean to that point as we cut back to thelma and louise they're driving along they get stuck behind this cattle drive in the middle of the road louise says look I got us into something that's going to get us killed. And I'm sorry about that. She even owns up to, she says, I don't know why I didn't go to the police in the first place. And Thelma says, you already said it. Nobody would have believe us. Mm-hmm. She says, that guy was hurting me. And if you hadn't come out, he would have hurt me a lot worse. And nothing would have happened because everybody saw me dancing with him that night. And they would have made out like I was asking for. And then she takes it one step further. And she says, you know, my life would have been a whole lot worse than it is now. At least now I'm having some fun. And I'm not sorry that that son of a bitch is dead. I'm just sorry it was you that killed him and not me. Yeah. They get through this cattle drive. They get to another gas station. And Louise calls Daryl's house to talk to Kaitel, who, again, is like, Louise, I want to help you, but you got to stop running. This is where he says, like, I know what's making you run. I know what happened to you in Texas. Well, she says to him, she's like, I keep thinking about words like life imprisonment and execution and death (laughs) by electrocution. And they have this drawn out conversation. And in the background, as she's saying all this, Thelma's there hearing these words from Louise, the conversation between 
between she and Harvey Keitel continues long enough that they can trace the call. And now the feds know where they are and they can go after him. Keitel is the one who demands like, you have to take me with you so nothing happens to them because this could get out of hand. It's also important to note the way the call ends is right after Keitel says to Louise, I look, I know what's making you run. I know what happened to you in Texas. Louise kind of goes cold. Mm -hmm. This really hits her hard. And it's Thelma who takes the phone receiver from her hand at this payphone and hangs up the phone. Absolutely. Louise does not do that. Yeah. Thelma and Louise, they go outside and Thelma talks to Louise about how Louise may be making a deal with the feds to get out of trouble. But Thelma, she says, I've, you know, kind of crossed over something like she's different and she cannot go back to the life she had before with Daryl as a housewife. She's like, I just, I couldn't live. I mean, the exact line is that something's crossed over in me and I can't go back. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's her whole character, right? Is that she has tasted freedom and liberation and being able to be her authentic self. And there is no way she can ever compromise again. It's the whole idea of you get what you settle for. And she is now unwilling to settle for anything other than her own authentic life. Yeah. It's, oh, it's so good. Can you believe this was her first screenplay? I'm in awe as how good, you know, and tight this movie became. So Thelma and Louise continue their journey in their car. The sky is now this beautiful, bright blue. The landscape is flush with green and Thelma says to Louise are you awake because I feel awake I don't ever remember feeling this awake like everything Mm -hmm. looks different I feel like we have something to look forward to and she says I want to get a job it's so good. There's a look on Louise's face when she's like, oh, yeah, you're going to work for Club Med. You know, get our, we'll get ourselves a Hacienda. But there's something in Louise that feels because earlier in that conversation when they were talking about, like, what did Harvey Keitel say? Louise tells Thelma, like, oh, we're going to be charged with murder and we have to decide whether we're going to come in dead or alive. And, and Thelma says, well, didn't he have anything good to say? You know, which is a good <laughs> joke. But it's also, again, this sense that at least like where Thelma is now blossoming and feeling herself louise is the one who's starting to realize like this probably isn't going to have a good ending like us getting to mexico probably isn't going to happen i think it mirrors the two scenes in the hotel room with the start of a relationship and the end of a relationship you know that she's seeing the beginning of a life that she could have thelma seeing the beginning of a life that she could have whereas louise is seeing the end of the life she does have yeah i think that's true before we get to the (laughs) the big finale there is one more moment where where we run across this truck driver again he asks him he says hey baby you ready for a big dick that's right and they're <laughs> like you know what how about you come with us he's like yeah yeah uh-huh. let's do this this is the most clueless individual of the yeah. movie because he follows them off into just some random part of the desert gets out of his truck comes strolling over to them who Thelma and louise are sort of sitting up in the seats in the convertible he's like all right i'm so glad you pre ladies decided to come on over they say you need to apologize to us and he's like what and they're like yeah uh, making all those lewd gestures point to your lap what exactly do you think was gonna happen there what if somebody behaved like that to your mom or your sister or your wife they just like dress down this dummy right and he's just like what what are you talking about Thelma says did you call us beavers on the cb i hate that he just seems confused by everything that's going on sure. here finally they pull guns on him and they want an apology and he's like fuck you but instead of shooting him because you know what he did is vile but it's not a murderous offense and they're not murderers. This no. is not a movie about two women going on a crime spree that involves murder. It's, no, it's not natural born killers. Right. So they shoot the tires of his truck. And when they ask him to apologize again and he gets, fuck you, they just shoot the truck, which explodes. As this thing explodes, they kind of do donuts around him in the desert. Thelma leans out and snags his dirty baseball cap off the ground as they pull away. And as they're leaving, Thelma says, where'd you learn to shoot like that, Louise? And she's like, I learned in Texas. Where'd you learn to shoot like that? And she's like, oh, just off TV. A couple things about this. You know, the moron truck driver. It's it's such a 90s moment from a film to see a tanker truck explode for really no good reason. Mm -hmm. And I think this was something that was pushed by the studio. I know that this scene did not play out the way the original script 
you know, was written, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that. You can go read the book that I recommended if you want to get more details on that. But I felt like just as a film, this scene feels a little out of place. This was the scene that didn't seem to fit quite right. He refers to them as bitches from hell, like yeah. he's Richard Lewis, and it feels very gratuitous. I will say that as I thought back on watching this movie, it does serve purpose in that it escalates their crimes. I mean, on top of armed robbery, and then you've got the murder, and then you've also got now whatever this is going to be of willful destruction of you know big oil or something <laughs> like that but also the ne- is it the next scene where we get the the guy in the desert with the police car it, it is right we can just talk about it. so we cut back to the desert where the police car is with the officer in the trunk and this guy rides up on the bike he, he looks like a rastafarian <laughs> and he comes up on the cop in the trunk and he hears him inside and he walks over you know with this big joint and just blows marijuana smoke into the bullet hole that they shot into the trunk i mean it's like a wee joke it feels woefully out of place in this movie it's like there's this weird thing where both with the trucker scene and this biker scene it feels like we're trying to lighten the movie up between these heavy moments of louise and thelma talking about their ultimate fates and where they are in life to the ending of this movie which is coming right up yes so it's like oh well let's lighten the mood before we get to something that's even heavier and i think it's i have one real complaint with this movie and this isn't it although i do think this feels we're kind of wedging in a little bit of levity so that it's not just a total downer of an ending i go back and forth on it i think that the movie would be better served by not having this scene the way it is but i think that the scene also serves purpose in showing that the cop didn't die in the trunk of the car <laughs> that they're not murderers you and i've certainly had this as we've discussed countless films on this podcast we're like what happened to this character how yeah. did this tie up they've tied up every loose end in this film if you take it out that's not the case yeah and speaking of wrapping up characters like we get a shot of like a police shopper circling this burning truck there's a shot of daryl looking miserable at home there's tobo and Kaitel loading up for the last ride like all these characters are we, we get kind of glimpses of them i think that last shot of daryl is actually more sympathetic to his character because as much as he took his wife for granted like at this point he's kind of lost everything oh for sure yeah 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 it it feels like there's a a moment of of realization everything i know is been turned upside down and i'm largely responsible for this yes i think that's true and then we get to kind of, i mean this is really it it's we're back on the road with Thelma and louise they see some cops pass by they arrive at the grand canyon yeah I, they seem a little surprised or i guess because they've never seen it <laughs> right of you know just how big it is and and you know just in all of its majesty and this movie is so beautifully shot if you've never seen it even having heard the entire plot it does not do this film justice one bit of just how gorgeous it is when some cops pass by them you know it doesn't look like they're pursuing them and thelma and louise you know louise driving of course says like you know we're not going to take a chance on them turning around so we're going to kind of cut through the desert but the cops do in fact spin around and start to pursue them then we see more cops headed their way and they essentially are playing chicken with these cops who are driving at them and they win because they just don't swerve right and the cops do as they're driving through the desert not on desert roads through the desert there are these like crazy cannonball run s crashes in their wake yeah. as police cars are flipping over and they're being pursued across this desert flat they go under this little bridge and it looks like they're going to get away for a second because one of the cops tries to follow them through the bridge and gets stuck because the car is too big which bottlenecks all the other cops there's this great moment where in a different movie that would be the moment of like oh we showed them but it's like Louise's hands are shaking. She's trying to smoke a cigarette, but she's barely holding it together. It's this really sweet moment where Thelma kind of says, you know, you're my best friend. And Louise says the same. Kind of reiterating at this point, no matter what happens, they're in it together. Yeah, Louise says to her, she says, Louise, I know this is all my fault, but I'm glad I came with you on this fishing trip. And Louise says, this isn't your fault. You know, that they're having this conversation. And you're right, you know, just that they acknowledge their friendship. And I also I love the fact that when Louise, when she says to her, you know, after Thermal says, you know, you're a good friend, Louise says, you're the best. And she says, how do you like the vacation so far? Yeah. And 
and they're <laughs> still cracking jokes, even though like the intensity of, of this finale is unmistakable. They almost drive off a cliff, and there's a great shot of the car on this cliff, and you see Tobo's chopper swinging around in the same shot. It's really well composed. Yeah. And they almost go over the side, and that's where Thelma's like, what is this? I guess, well, I guess it's the goddamn Grand Canyon. Yeah. And as they're looking over the edge, like, the chopper rises over the lip of the canyon, facing them. And you see a lot of snipers loading their guns. They turn around to go back, and there's a whole line of police cars there with cops like you said sniper rifle scopes ready to shoot them and Kaitel like busts ass out of this helicopter when it lands and is telling everybody not to shoot he says don't shoot those girls yeah. is what he calls them. so Thelma and Louise are in their car there's a cliff in front of them there are the cops behind them the officers shout out for them to raise their hands anything that they do that is not in compliance with the direct order will will be considered a threat a direct order from all of these men yes they're all men yes and Thelma says Louise let's not get caught let's keep going yeah and she says just go and Louise says are you sure and Thelma says yeah and then they laugh slightly and at the same time they're holding back tears they kiss which uh, you know like there is an argument to be made that there are some lesbian undertone to this movie that's not how i read it yeah, i don't get that at all i i think it's a very platonic like we're sisters yeah and but they they kiss louise hits the pedal the photograph they took that polaroid spins up out of the car to kind mm -hmm. of flutter away Kaitel is chasing after them which kind of gets in the way of a direct shot of either of them right so in a way there is an argument to be made that he protects them kind of i mean obviously that's not what it's about and this is the part of the movie that i like the least which is the car goes over the edge of the canyon mm -hmm. it fades to white and then we just get this montage of them like having fun like what a great adventure this was and that always feels like a bizarre way to end this movie the car going over the edge of the cliff and the fade to white i totally get yeah the montage i'm like totally out of place to me i think what they struggled with was how do you end a movie like this in the year 1991 without it just being a total downer Mm -hmm. you know you fade to white and then roll credits the audience is gonna be like what was that it's an ending that runs counter to almost every single movie that's released in theater. it's an indie movie kind of ending yeah and it works for an indie but as a you know a major studio release with legit big stars and a you know incredibly talented director and crew and everything else one version of the ending that they talked about was they wanted to take the polaroid and have it fade from the color photo back to into its original state that seemed a little bit too confusing and then there's the other ending that i mentioned in the intro where for a brief moment the car lands and it keeps going that was never the original they were gonna die like cali curry knew that from the beginning i don't disagree with your critique of the ending with the montages of seeing them in a happier state but i I just don't know how, unless this is an indie film and you fade to white and they are dead and then roll credits and, you know, you're dealing with something that's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid or Invasions of the Body Snatchers. Like, this is a very down movie and they just didn't want to end that. I think that by having those images of them, it shows, you know, you kind of see that journey and the love and the friendship that these two women had. I just, I don't know that they could find that perfect way to align with audience expectations and yet not undermine the intent of the film i mean it's definitely tricky and i'm not yeah. saying that for me the ending is just the fade to white yeah and have you ever seen the ending with them driving off <laughs> no dude i knew of it and i never wanted to see that that seems terrible go find it on youtube if you'd seen this in the theater you would have taken off your shoe and thrown it at the screen <laughs> i mean it's because it's got bb king singing it's some song like you know you're gonna land on your feet you're gonna land you know so it's insulting how bad it is the only way that could be okay is if the implication was that they had died and they were driving in heaven like the end of greece like that's they just, right like, oh. if the car flew off into the sky and it's you're the one that i love you are the one i love <laughs> another ending i detest yes <laughs> that is like 20 however many seconds i don't even know if it's that montage at the end right. is 20 seconds long i mean it is that minor a complaint a couple of like atonal moments with the truck and the the guy blowing pot smoke into the trunk right those are the biggest complaints that i can find with a movie that is over two hours long and there is probably i don't know 
one total minute of the movie that I am not totally wild about, but it is so chock full of just good performances and tight dialogue and incredible cinematography and just the set decoration and the way that it's framed. It's just, man, it really holds up. I mean, and yeah. it, it still feels like relevant and important. And... Right, because men are <laughs> awful. Yeah. <laughs> None of this has changed. I, mean, I think some of the discussion around this movie, like when it came out, that the fact that they didn't have the marketing budget that they needed, that there was controversy around the movie, got people to go see it. I think that there was some thought that this may herald in an era of women-themed films, which did not happen. I mean... If only, yeah. You've certainly seen just growth in cinema and the types of you know stories that are being shown but i mean if you look at what's you know goes to theaters now even post covid it's superheroes and animated films and horror movies i don't know where a movie like this finds a home in present day cinema if it, it would even get made right it, it's a streaming movie that 14 people saw right and yeah and then you know it's one of the unfortunate things about the loss of the monoculture is that we don't really have a way for this to become a thing that engages popular discussion in a big broad way it's just not the world we live in anymore or you have movies like everything everywhere all at once that gets a huge amount of attention but you don't have situations where there are movies like this in any given year there would have been you know six to fifteen indie films you know with varying degrees of production value and star power that could have been made and now you just you don't see that yeah you know we talked about harvey keitel and his penis i mean like the piano is a movie like how would how, would that get made today would it find an audience would it get made today maybe would it find an audience almost assuredly not right it's really rare i, I think the everything everywhere all at once is, is a good example of a movie that sort of despite itself is incredibly popular yeah there was a world in which that movie came out and disappeared pretty quickly even though i mean it got a lot of awards attention and and so forth and uh, you know and i love that movie but there are other movies that come out you know to use another sort of female-centric film as an example last year that movie women talking mm -hmm. uh, came out yeah and that would be a movie like a thelma and louise that is like oh this is actually this really interesting well-directed well-performed movie that is just chock full of good script good performances really well shot a really interesting director with sarah Pauly behind it and yeah it got some award recognition but how many people have seen that movie yeah thelma and louise wasn't a box office hit the way that naked gun two and a half was but whatever you know <laughs> it's one other thing that again i didn't touch on because there's so much richness behind the history of this particular film it did not make as much money at the box office as a lot of the big action films of that era did but what really helped it was the at-home market mm. you know so movies you know used to have the theatrical release then you would have the release in blockbuster and hollywood video or knockoff joint you had in your town and then you had its run on hbo or other pay tv services so there were those three waves and for people looking for something to to watch you know on a friday night when thelma and louise was released it was incredibly popular it sold very well the audience found the movie and was able to share that with others so again that's something else as far as reaching that broader audience yeah you can pipe it into your house but you're competing with this insurmountable wave of other media that is vying for your attention and sadly what i think a lot of people do is in the face of here's something new and different yeah or i could just watch something that i've seen before that i'm comfortable with i'll I'll watch reruns of friends or the office or <laughs> you know the simpsons or whatever else rather than spending two hours trying something that isn't going to bring me comfort in a time where it seems like everything around us is falling but that's a conversation for another day like you said terrific movie it's probably the best most successful movie we've ever discussed on on this show it's nice to deep dive on a movie like this every now and again don't i mean yeah. don't worry folks we're getting back to crap but <laughs> um it is nice every now and again on the show to deep dive on a movie that we're not necessarily just like getting the knives out for but just to appreciate like this is such a well-made well-crafted exciting movie i don't know i'm curious to to hear what listeners think of an episode like this that isn't just hey we're gonna do goofy voices and talk about how <laughs> shitty a movie is 
and instead go through a movie that's like, this movie is really good and, and kind of here's why. And here's the things that you may not have noticed about this movie and the way that it moves and the parallels in it and things like that. Like, it feels like we were doing honest to goodness, like movie discussion. Yeah. I'll be curious. So listeners, <laughs> drop us a line. Let us know what you think. And if, if you would like to see more of this, uh, spoilers, you were going to see more of this. Although the, <laughs> the other one we're going to do this season that is arguably a good movie, quote unquote, a good movie is fucking bananas. I'll tell you what's not fucking bananas. Our next episode, Ooh. which we're going back into the trash heap for this one. So would you care to introduce... <laughs> yeah. What's coming up in two weeks' time? Hitchhiking, Chad. Everybody's doing it. Brad Pitt was doing it in this movie. No one has done it in a more frightening way than perhaps... Even cowgirls get the blues. Uh, <laughs> oh, that movie. Speaking of Tom Robbins. Yeah, so Rucker Hauer was in a really tense, well-crafted thriller in the 80s called The Hitcher. Yeah, C. Thomas Howell was in that. Not wearing blackface. Not pretending to be a black man. Jennifer Jason Lee was in that movie. Was she naked? in that movie i don't recall her being naked i recall her being pulled apart by a, a semi which is unpleasant her biological father was that guy who died in the twilight zone movies which also had a very famous hitchhiker episode and you know i can't go into any more of this without absolutely spoiling the introduction for the next episode <laughs> but oh, i don't sorry. want listeners to think like oh that sounds like a good movie too because it kind of is the Hitcher kind of rocks. Uh, yes. But they did a much shittier remake of the movie, and that's the one we're going to talk about with Sean Bean and a bunch of people you never heard of. Well, that sounds like a delightfully bad time. It's going to be difficult to watch. All right. Unlike this movie, which is an absolute fucking treat from the opening to the end. We finished our salad. For the next course, we're going to have an entire can of frosting. <laughs> Yeah, it, the, yes, it is very much like peel back the foil on the Duncan Hines buttercream frosty. Get out your spoon. Turn out the lights because no one needs to see you like that. Spoon. Fingers. Oh, they call that the DeSantis. <laughs> Drop us a line. You can email us at pick 6 movies at gmail.com. We're around here, there, and social this and whatever that. So, Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Thelma and Louise? Let me just check with Harvey Keitel's penis. Was this the, the best movie we've ever done? You got that right. Okay. Best movie we ever did. Thanks, Harvey Keitel's penis. <laughs> we'll see everyone in two weeks' time. Thanks, for everybody.